Mythos Busters, investigating the mystery, monsters, and madness of Arkham Horror, the card game. Hello and welcome to episode 37 of Mythos Busters, where what we got you want, but it might be hard to handle. I'm Sean. Joining me tonight is Ian. Hi, Ian. Hi. Uh, So last episode, we made you pull the early card, and uh, tonight Mm -hmm. you're making us play the late card. And I just want to publicly acknowledge that you have the raw end of that particular stick. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. (laughs) Much rather stay up late than get up early, for sure. Uh, Joining as well is Scott. Hi, Scott. Hello. How are thee, sir? Uh, I am much more rested than I was a week ago. (laughs) <laughs> That's good. Yep. I know you're at a you're a pretty depleted spot last last week. So, oh boy, yeah, working <laughs> 10, 12 hour shifts in twelve days is not for the faint of heart. I'm but. fairly certain I would actually die. Just I'm just drop dead on the job. Like, it, what, what's the Japanese word for that? It, it was a phenomenon for a while, so it actually got its own word. Ooh, I don't where you know. work where you work to death. Yeah, I Karushi. Can't that's remember. right. Oh. Well. Thanks, Jeff. Anyway, uh, so despite what you right might note. think, <laughs> um, well, welcome to episode 37 of Mythos Busters. Nick is gone tonight. Uh, I believe he's actually mid-performance right now, and uh, I actually had a chance to see his play last weekend, and it, you know, nice. it wasn't a tough sell because Young Frankenstein is the best Mel Brooks movie. <laughs> I, I love me some, I love me some blazing saddles and Spaceballs has a special place in my heart but you can fight me if you don't agree. I'm surprised um, Nick convinced them to put the strip tease in there. So, <laughs> the strip tease scene well, was, it was the, uh, the tassels were so tasteful. Yeah, that's fair. He can really yeah. twirl them too. Good on him. Casey producers is probably a close second but I still prefer Young Frankenstein. Um so anyway, we'll catch him on the next one. I just wanted to, to actually publicly say that uh, Nick did a really good job. So, you know, when he comes back and talks about it next time on Tentacle Time, know that he, he, he earned it. He, he got it. We're good. Break, break limbs, Nick. <clears throat> yeah. You just need him to get, get him to do the, uh, the Witch House musical now. <laughs> I'm still <laughs> pulling for that. I, I think Nick might be hairy enough to play Brown Jenkin. <laughs> <laughs> I will fly out to Minnesota to watch that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, tonight we've got your normal segments. We're going to cover some awesome news. And by God, guys, it happened for once because we, we fainted and went uh, we went and recorded on a different day. We actually had some news drop this afternoon. That's pretty big. So we're going to discuss that as well. Uh, and our main topic tonight, we're going to be doing our normal scenario roundup of Black Stars Rise and Dim Carcosa. And of course, spoilers. We'll round, <laughs> we'll round it out with a bit of technical time. Uh, so, before we get to any of that, though, a couple things I want to make everyone aware of. We've got uh, two events that you might want to square in the back of your mind for Gen Con. Now, sadly, we, <laughs> we failed a little bit in communication this year by the time this episode released. Regular events will have uh, probably been filled, but we'll see. Mythos Busters is running an event at Gen Con. Ian, fill us in on the details because I've completely forgotten them. (laughs) I know, I was like frantically scrolling. (laughs) (laughs) So our event is on the Saturday of Gen Con, which is August 4th, and it's going to be at 1 p.m. I'm not sure of the exact location yet, but uh, we will bother you about that several times between now and then so you won't Mm -hmm. get lost but anyway uh the main thing is just uh if you're listening right now on our discord make sure if you're going to gen con you uh add our event to your wish list and if you're hearing this later uh just go ahead and uh pop on over to the gen con event listing search for it's just called mythos busters listener event you'll find it and uh if there's tickets left you can just go ahead and get tickets for that uh we will have some swag which we will not disclose what that is yet <laughs> uh yeah but if 
you're not familiar with what we're doing, it's basically just the chance for uh, Mythos Busters listeners and the Arkham community in general just to get together and play some Arkham. So nothing too formal. You're not going to have to do formal introductions or speeches or anything like that. Just show up ready to play and that's it. And I do want to point out now that if you go over there and there are no <clears throat> tickets left, I have no idea how well we're going to do this year numbers wise. <laughs> Uh, feel free to, to still keep it you know penciled in on your calendar. Pop yeah. by, say hi. If we have extra swag, we're happy to give it out to, to those who come after all the ticketed people have, have gotten their allocations. Um, but it, it is really just a super casual meetup. We'll probably be playing the Gen Con quest. Um, I'm going to say now as well, everyone planned to bring at least one scenario with you. Because last year, everyone <laughs> showed up assuming everyone else had brought the scenarios. Yeah. And dividing into groups got weird. So just everyone be ready to play. And then after the, the Mythos Busters proper event through Gen Con, the other thing I want to make everyone aware of is that uh, for the past few years through Cardboard of the Rings, we've actually been able to have kind of a cool little co-op LCG, I guess, send-off post-mortem party Saturday night at the Slippery Noodle, which is just a couple walks block from the event center. We rent out the basement, and we do uh, what's called Gen Con After Dark, or it was Cardboard of the Rings After Dark. We're expanding it now. Mythos Busters is a part of it, and of course all the Cardboard of the Rings listeners are, are going to be invited as well. I think we had something like, did we break 50 last year? Probably with all the filters in and out. 50, 60 people, somewhere around there? Probably, yeah, I think so. It's getting bigger every year, and yeah. you know, we see return faces, we meet new people, it's a hell of a lot of fun. Basically, we rent out the basement, we have some private servers, um, we have a custom flight of beer, uh, they've got a full bar, you can order off the menu, so basically you just come by, you eat, you drink, we generally play kind of more casual party games. What, mm-hmm. yeah, oh God, what was what was in hot demand last year? We had a ton of happy salmon. <laughs> yep. <laughs> that was the thing that happened. Uh, code names. A uh, year before that, we had some giant games of deception. So that sort of thing. Cobra so Paw, sound- yeah. <laughs> yes, Cobra Paw. <laughs> we had a couple nails dig into fingers from Cobra Paw. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> if that sounds like something that uh, would interest you, and it should because it's a lot of fun. It's going to be Saturday night at 8 p.m. at the Slippery Noodle. It's not something you have to register for. This is an unofficial Gen Con event. This is just something we do as uh, have done as part of the podcast community. And uh, just come on, show up. Say you're here for After Dark. There's no cover charge at the door yet. If we if we tend to expand from here, we might have to start busting into more venues and actually paying covers. But for now, it's free. Just tell them you're with the party. And it's going to be a lot of fun this year. Gen Con is about to become real real now with uh, registration coming up. (laughs) It is, no joke, always such a highlight of every Gen Con is after dark. It's it's like the perfect way to wrap it up, get together, and uh, if you haven't been to one before and you're, you know, you have the thoughts like I have sometimes, like, oh, who's going to be there? Am I going to get welcomed? Yes. Like, you will be fine. Like, there's always new people trickling in, and you, next thing you know, you're playing a game or talking to people. So it's good. And, and just just the crowd that comes is just so – it's the sweet spot of people I enjoy, at least. Like, it tends to be a little older, a little bit more mature. It's not really a party atmosphere. It's more just people kind of being jovial and having drinks. And, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a real good time. So – that interests you saturday 8 p.m at gen con keep that spot clear all right so let's move it on guys what have you been playing lately uh scott i know you've been super busy have you even gotten a chance to play of late uh not really i think my last play was finishing up the whole carcosa cycle um mm. on expert and mm. uh we did not finish it finished us yeah um, <laughs> Yeah. But I was very proud with how far we got on Expert. So I was about to say, considering how hard that scenario is on Standard, I can't imagine Expert <laughs> is anything but just like an express tube down. Yeah. For you know real. what? We were doing okay, and then a few of the locations where you flip and it heals horror, we got really lucky with a few of those. Ooh. Um, and then there those was are one, important. Yeah, and then one turn we were... We, we were I want to say like we were kind of even ground with the scenario like we're making progress we're controlling the monsters and then there was one uh 
mythos phase that just ended the game. Like, it just... Cards <laughs> came off the top, things moved, and we all died. Uh, and I was like... That oh. sounds like Dim Carcosa to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, darn minus eight token. God, that thing is brutal. <laughs> I'd rather the tentacle. Like, that's how bad minus eight is sometimes. But... Yeah. Yeah. Ian, how about you? What have you what have you been playing? Uh well I uh I kind of intentionally left Solo Windy till the end because uh I had so much fun playing uh her and the Dunwich run was so insanely like tense that I, I was like, okay, let me kind of save the best for last before uh Forgotten Age comes out. So I ran uh Windy through all of Carcosa solo and she actually made it through Dim Carcosa. Uh, successfully uh, and went in with uh, 44 XP so it was uh, I'd say it's definitely the most I mean the only other solo <laughs> campaign that was successful so Safina so maybe it doesn't say much to say that this was the most successful solo campaign I had but it, it really was like she was able to drop uh, what did I have six tally marks on the stranger over the course of the campaign uh, that'll help and yeah, just, you know, she was using the Obol, of course, to get the extra XP, but uh, <laughs> it was, and uh, basically going into Dim Carcosa, the the good thing is when you're playing through the campaign now is you, it's kind of at that point where I was towards the end of Dunwich, where you know how to game a lot of the scenarios and the right paths yeah. to take and all that. Uh, <laughs> that being said, Dim Carcosa was still tense, because even if you know how to game it, it's... Uh, it's rough. I'm still boggles my mind when people are saying, oh, it's an easy scenario. I'm like, what? I must just suck at this game then because it it gives it's so like tense every time. But uh, this time I had the key so that uh, with three whore on it with Wendy. So she was getting plus three. And then I had Cat Burglar and uh, Pete. So that's another plus two. So she was evading Haster at nine <laughs> each time, Ooh. which is helpful. I Seems um really good. <laughs> yeah, I have to say <laughs> yeah. the the I, th- I want to say like three yeah three out of three successful campaigns I have through Carcosa had the key out in Dim Carcosa. Yeah, it's just so <laughs> it good. matters. Oh, that card's really really good. It, this is actually my first campaign ever using both Relic Hunter and Charisma. Wowzer! Yeah. So, uh, Wendy. What allies do you in- end up with with uh, with Wendy? Pretty much the P and Cat Burglar are kind of the key ones there that I was using. P, of course, okay. is just amazing in Dim Carcosa um, mm-hmm. to soak up that horror. And uh, and Cat Burglar, you know, adds on to the agility boost you get from P. And plus, is just super helpful to do- dodge away from enemies. Yep. Yeah. But yeah, I actually uh, used Relic Hunter in a deck, guys. <laughs> Because with that achievement, I, achievement unlocked, yeah, with the amulet and the key, it was actually pretty useful. You know, the thing was, I just had bad luck, and the key never came out. The it only in Black Stars Rise, and then uh, Dim Carcosa is the only scenario I actually got use out of it. But it was well worth it. <laughs> <laughs> it's an amazingly good card. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Ian, I gotta uh, ask: uh, playing with the Obol, uh, does that make mm-hmm. every single token pull like eight times more stressful? Um, yes and no. I mean, like I said, because I can, if it was more of a blind run or I wasn't as familiar with scenarios, Mm. but this one I kind of knew like what the stressful points are, but there was, it does make some situations a lot more tense. I got myself in an oopsie moment in Paladin (laughs) Mask because I was like, I always, I promised myself I wouldn't go hunting for XP because I have the Obol, but the Spectre of Death was sitting there. (laughs) And I had double or nothing and backstab in my head. <laughs> so I said, hmm. So I, I went up at plus three uh, with a card in hand to get a mulligan on the token using Wendy's ability. And I could have boosted to plus four, but I figured it, it was probably better to do plus three plus a mulligan. Because the only mm-hmm. thing that would defeat me is a negative four and a tentacle. I'm like, what are the odds? So I draw a negative four, mulligan, pull it back, <laughs> negative four, fail. Ah. <laughs> uh. And the thing with the specter is it has retaliate, so it attacked me, and that was also last action, so it attacked me again. 
Uh, so I was very close. That was my closest call where I was like, yeah, that was puckering time right there. Yeah, I Ian, managed... you got the, uh, you got the nothing side of that bet. Just yeah, I managed to escape. I, I later asked, uh, Motux in our discord, who is very good with the probability statistics and, uh, they crunched the numbers and it was something like a 99% chance that I should have been successful. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So what you're uh, saying is you're the one percent. One percent confirmed. Yeah. <laughs> so I think for my part, the only thing that that I've been playing that's worth mentioning is I've been kind of trysting back again with trying to love True Solo because I want to because I appreciate what it does for for kind of streamlining and making a game quicker and requires less mental bandwidth. Blah 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 blah. Um. The problem is I like to play Mystics, and I, I'm just finding that Agnes gets there. She's probably the most consistent of them, but god damn. It, it just it creates more swinginess, right? Because in solo, you're already all on your own. If you draw three enemies in a row, no one's there to bail you out. You're already kind of swinging by the tail of the encounter deck swing, swinginess. And then when you go Mystic, who generally need cards to come out in the right order or at least somewhat resembling the right order, uh, for them to get up and operating at an efficient pace. It can be a bit of a thing. And my luck swings hard, it turns mm-hmm. out. Well, I think, too, with Mystic, uh, you have some really great cards. Like, Shriveling is a great weapon, but you only have two copies, right? Like, mm-hmm. Right of Seeking, a great clue-getting thing. You only have two copies. And so, if you don't get your setup, you're much more... Uh, available to be kicked in the dick by the encounter deck, <laughs> you know, yes. like yeah, caught slightly more flat-footed mm-hmm. or bow-legged, I suppose. If if the dick punch is the threat, I guess um, so. <laughs> but yeah, so basically, I decided at the end of I think I played what I played core, or I played Dunwich almost halfway through before I just conceded that campaign because it was just going so horribly and then I started up again. So I played like three campaigns, most more or less solo, and I'm just like, no, nope, I, I guess I've just kind of figured out what I uh, what I like. I'm, I'm a two-handed man through and through, and I can rest assured in the fact that I have challenged that preconception very recently and confirmed it. <laughs> yeah. Which is nice to know, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. Uh, so we're going to skip community highlights. Obviously, Nick's still out and busy. He's less, the least prepared of any of us, I'm sure. He's got so much going on with that play. So let's skip on into the news, of which we have some exciting pieces. Ian, lay it on us. Yep. do 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 news. Um, so the big thing before I Wait, go Wait, hang to... on. Was that a sound effect, or was that a stalling tactic while you scrolled down the show notes? <laughs> I wasn't sure if that Both? was like the more... <laughs> Go with sound close. effect. <laughs> <laughs> um, so before I go into the actual articles, the uh, one of the big pieces of news is just that Forgotten Age is coming out on May 10th, which is next week. So oh my when, god, it's six days. <laughs> yep, by the time you are listening to this episode, if you are not listening on Discord right now, then uh, you should be very close to the release of Forgotten Age. So uh, it always feels like it's a long wait, but it's actually not that long, uh, especially if you also play Lord of the Rings and you know the meaning of long waits. Um, (laughs) So the first article we got was Heart of the Elders, which is the third Mythos pack in the Forgotten Age cycle. So uh, this one is going to be focusing on, it follows on the events of the Boundary of Beyond, and now it's kind of going to be f- focusing more on the uh, wilderness aspect. So I know some people were wondering, oh, we're going to go back to Arkham and just stay there. But that's not the case. And this one is kind of interesting because it actually is has a 5A and 5B. So two separate scenarios or sub-scenarios or however they're going to divide and do this. There uh, apparently are two scenarios. One where you're trying to find... Uh, this kind of cave that you're trying to get to, and then the 5B is going to be actually going inside. So I'm not sure exactly how that's going to work. I think my guess is it's probably going to be something like the transition is going to be, you know, clearing the board of locations and putting out a new set of locations, something like that. 
It'll be like when you split up in Foundations of Stone in Lord of the Rings. Drink. (laughs) Perhaps it could be. Uh, So as far as player cards, uh, the first one, which I'm going to read because it's a green card, uh, and it's also freaking amazing, so I'm going to selfishly take it. Uh, This is... (laughs) Lola Santiago, not to be confused with our other Lola. This is a rogue asset, three cost, three XP. Uh, she's a no nonsense archaeologist, has two intellect icons, the ally and wayfarer traits. You get plus one intellect and plus one agility, free action, exhaust Lola Santiago and spend X resources, discover one clue at your location. X is the shroud value of your location. And she has two health and two sanity. That seems like <laughs> if you just took away her ability, she's already pretty good. Sure. And yeah, then you add in her stuff. free action. <laughs> like, wow. Yeah. Free action. That's not. <laughs> it does not cost you an action. Mm-hmm. Nope. <sighs> well, by the click economy or the resources, uh-uh, 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 I'm just. Uh-uh. <laughs> Is it just me, or does the art make her seem like she's a very modern woman? Like, just just the way her hair sits and her finely manicured eyebrows, she does not look like she's in the 20s. Mm. Yeah, yeah kind of. It kind of me. has that style to it. She also doesn't seem like an archaeologist, because I feel like every archaeologist is just covered in dust all the time. <laughs> Where, maybe she's right at the start of her day. You know? Especially when you're wearing white out to a very dusty location. <laughs> and after Labor Day, no less. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, this ability is just I mean, we've talked on the podcast before about how good like Tesla's um uh, action mm-hmm. successes are. And this is you just discover clues on demand as long as you have the resources, which rogues are kind of good at having. So mm-hmm. Well and I even think like like you said, the testless action of it, if you're using money to boost your stats to investigate, why not just pay money and not test you know like that that seems like an awesome ability so right if it's like a two shroud location that's what you would have spent to boost like streetwise you might as well just get the clue Mm -hmm. (laughs) and not worry about a test yeah yeah and she also goes oddly enough really well in lola because as as we know kluver lola is still i'm gonna argue best lola Mm -hmm. and like she can take this card, great passive uh, buffs, and then, you know, when she switches to rogue roll and has the has the dough, then you can get the rest of it. Hmm. Yeah. That's Fantastic a really good ally. Play. Lola and Lola. New deck. Yep. It's going to be a thing. Lola squared. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, uh, the only downside, it's not even really a downside, is just the rogue ally slot is getting very crowded, but uh, Obol's a thing and Charisma's a thing, so... Mm-hmm. It, well, I think not that big three Lola, five Furious. <laughs> <laughs> she, I think she fills it a slightly different spot than a lot of the rogue allies, though. Like, I totally agree. It like the ally slot's getting crowded for a lot of um, classes, mm-hmm. but this one is like, it's not. It adds a little bit of agility, but it really adds to the cluver or the, the clue side of the allies. So if you're going yeah. for clues and not evading, like she's just a snap pick. Sure. But. Definitely one of the strongest allies around, I think. Uh, the next spoiled card is also an ally, and uh, this one is not as clear cut because it sent our Discord channel into pretty much a college course on probability for a while. <laughs> where people have <laughs> oh, been man. Doing extensive probability analysis of how good Olive is with different combinations of cards. So uh, why don't you go ahead and read Olive, Sean? Oh, it'll take all of my will to do this. (laughs) Groan. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) All right, so Olive McBride will try anything once. Nice. And most things twice, from what I hear. Oh, jeez. Is a mystic... What? She's very... Like, she'll give something a second go. It's good. She's open to new ideas. Um, So she's a (laughs) level zero, two-cost mystic ally... She has a willpower icon. She has the ally and witch traits and uh, has the reaction ability. When you would reveal a chaos token, exhaust Olive McBride. 
Reveal three chaos tokens instead of one. Choose one of those tokens to resolve and ignore the other. She has one health, three sanity, and obviously takes up the ally slot. So what I really appreciated about all that math that was going on in our Discord is that it just feels so mystic, right? Like, you want to try to quantify it, Mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, there's so much going on with the Chaos Bag and your stats and what you commit and, you know, different effects that you might be triggering off of the different... Like, she's just this crazy wild card that you throw in. Like, ugh. I, I have no idea if she's good. Like, she seems good in, in theory. But I have no idea if she's actually good, but she just seems fun. I think she's she's pretty good. And she's almost like a, a, a level zero precursor to Grotesque Statue in a sure. completely different slot. Um, yeah, you just have to be prepared for the fact you're choosing two of them. Um, <laughs> so that might be like yeah. a minus four, a minus three, and a minus two. So you just drew a minus five. But... <laughs> there's also yeah. the option of like a zero a one and a three and now it's just a minus one so i think she's pretty good and the price is right i mean two costs for an ally with that soak too yeah uh, that's a nice sanity soak this was one when i first saw the article i was like good thing i wasn't drinking anything because that would have been a legit <laughs> spit take because i was like what the <laughs> hell is this car this is complete garbage and then i was like wait a minute ian remember renfield Take yeah a minute, step back it's hard to quantify purple cards isn't it yeah it really is without you know without knowing what other cards are coming and i think like it, if it's just a straight like mystic build i i don't think i'm gonna go with olive over like the other mystic ally options but if i'm gonna build for her specifically like for jim or something like that uh, or I want to make sure that hypnotic gazes are always going off, things like yep. that, then I think Olive, what she does do is bring something to the table that just didn't exist before, or I, I guess it did exist in kind of bits and pieces here, but I feel like the chaos bag manipulation archetype is really, especially with the seal stuff coming, it's really uh, getting a kick. Ugh. Oh, I'm so excited. This is exactly what I wanted to see explored back when we were looking at that core set and we saw Grotesque Statue. Mm. Like, this is what I wanted to see because this seems so fun. Like, it's going to be swingy as hell. And I'm probably going to have moments where I absolutely hate it, but really cool. And, um, yeah, I... The more effects we get, like Hypnotic Gaze, where you're revealing a token and actually hoping for a bad stuff token, hopefully we'll continue to get more of that stuff, but she becomes amazing if we can hit like a critical mass of those cards in a single deck. Mm-hmm. Yeah, pretty good can... for Song of the Dead, if if, if he can yeah. succeed at Ooh. the test. Yeah, I think she belongs in gym more than any other Yes, uh, well, That would make sense. He cares most about tokens. <laughs> Well, the thing I like about that, too, is the constant refrain over and over is, Jim is boring, Jim has a boring ability, you know, which I've been guilty of saying myself, but I think with things like Olive, we're getting to a place where Jim, if anything, will not be boring when you're exhausting Olive Mm -hmm. and trying those tokens. Yes, look at all of these new tools Jim is getting. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, did I slip that one under the radar? All right. (laughs) Olive. (laughs) Yes. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw an achievement that uh, the first person who uh, has all of out goes to draw three, and then for each of those three uses a grotesque statue on each of them. <laughs> I'll give you a dollar <laughs> just for the like. Uh, Motex, find the stats in that because I don't know how you would calculate that on a spreadsheet, but. That's like a, a science a, fiction story where you need to short circuit the robot or something. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Trying to make the AI destruct itself. <laughs> yeah. So this is going to be an interesting one. I, uh, if, if nothing else, Olive is an amazing gambler because uh, uh, apparently how it works is that in House Always Wins, if you're drawing two of those uh, tokens that that provide good stuff then both of them go off 
Oh yeah, so you could get what is it? Is it minus minus three if you succeed, get three resources? So just be six up on every test and you're cool. Is that what you were referring to? I yeah, well there's that aspect and there's also the uh God, it's been so long since I've played the House Always Wins. Now I'm trying to remember the uh the card room uh where you're gambling. Uh right. the card room? Yeah. <laughs> yep. oh, you're at, oh, which, oh you're wondering which the what the numbers are and stuff yeah i'm trying to remember exactly what the oh, tokens are in that thing that's weird because like if you reveal a positive number you do it's this positive number and elder sign right isn't it yeah, yeah. but if you reveal yes. two things you could like get the clues plus the money plus also a negative yeah, how does that result? No, no, we're not. We're not diving down. I, into I think. Rules. I think it just you resolve each of them. Okay, that I would make think, sense. Yeah. I, yeah, that's exactly what this would seem to imply. Yeah, because I think it gives you what is it? Two clues and two resources, something like that. The elder is side does. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So she's she's essentially the card mechanic equivalent of slipping a quarter into the vending machine on a string and popping it back out and slipping it back in again. Like they did in the cartoons. Yeah. Sure. Or, right. Uh, sure. Or, Too uh, far. Sh- right. Terminator Two with a credit card, right? <laughs> yeah, let's do that. <laughs> uh, okay, so they rounded us out nicely by giving us a survivor card as well. It's perfect. So it is perfect <laughs> against all yeah. odds. It is perfect. So why don't you read this one? Oh Scott? God. Okay, against all odds <laughs> is a survivor event. It's two cost level two. Uh, it's got the willpower combat and agility pips on it spirit traded and as fast when you would perform a skill test with a difficulty higher than your base skill value uh, reveal x additional chaos tokens for this skill test choose one to resolve and ignore the rest x is the difference between the uh, test difficulty and your base skill value that's pretty sweet so it's like uh, what's, what's the three wild icon skill oh rise to the no, occasion it's, yeah it's like yes. rise to the occasion but it works <laughs> <laughs> actually they're completely different effects but i think this is going for the same idea but i think you can you could perform this with that as well right so you let's say you're two down you play this and then no if you're t- oh. if you're two down you can't play the skill that's why it's unplayable you have to be three down i thought it was just two Nope. Is mm. it two? No, it's three. No, is it two? It's Either two. way, now I'm wondering, can you put this card before you add your skill uh, cards in? So, like, if you're three down and then you pump yourself to, like, two up, then you still reveal three tokens. I think, I think that's so, because it it's works. your base skill value. Yeah, it's right? your base so skill, so it's before yeah. anything bumps like you it. Boost it. Yeah, this is pretty good. Calvin will love it because his base skill is terrible for every stat. So. <laughs> yeah, it's a good Calvin card. <laughs> Too bad he has to get through a scenario first before he can take it. <laughs> this would be great in Carcosa when the uh, man in the pallid mask is at like a five shroud location and then he adds two to it. And then so <laughs> yeah. Calvin goes in, he's like, hey, so I reveal seven tokens. <laughs> Give me that elder sign. Mm-hmm. Revealing half the bag. Yeah. You just gotta pump it up to seven, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I th- I think this will be a cool one of for a test yeah. that you're like, I need to pass this test. I'm willing to throw half my hand into this to make sure I pass. Um, and being able to reveal that many I got the that many tokens. Yeah, it, it's kind of a nice like midway point to will to survive because will to survive is like your bomb turn. And Mm -hmm. so sometimes I've been in situations where, like, it stays in hand for a while because you don't want to waste your will to survive on just some piddly investigation or combat against some little enemy. And so Mm -hmm. against all odds might be good for those situations. Yeah, I suppose Casey brings up a good point in the chat. Like, do you take this at the same cost as Stroke of Luck? I suppose the one thing you're banking on is that stroke of luck is a for sure thing, but you exile it, whereas this stays in your deck, but it's still, yeah, you, know, you could still fail. Hmm. I think I still like stroke of luck better. Mm. Yeah, but. I think so too. A basic, I mean, more or less guaranteed win. 
But then again, this one you ensure that you do not pull the t- the tentacle. Cause yeah, that's most kind of the advantage God. it has. <laughs> These are hard to quantify. I like it. <laughs> yeah. I like it. That's how I like my cards. All right. Different strokes for different folks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I operate on gut feel at the end of the day anyway, so why don't, I'd just prefer if the rest of the world existed in that sphere. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> my gut feels like I have a million dollars in the bank. <laughs> So that is uh, Heart of the Elders. So we got some interesting cards coming up for sure. Um, speaking of interesting cards, people have been clamoring to see the last investigator from Forgotten Age. And FFG finally obliged with their article on a mission from God. Which, with a title like that, it's no surprise that uh, Father Mateo is our mystic. So... Uh, Let's go ahead and have Sean read that one. Father Matteo is the priest. He's our new mystic investigator. He has four willpower, three intellect, two combat, three agility, the believer and warden traits. Reaction. After an investigator reveals a tentacle chaos token, cancel that token and treat it as an elder sign token instead. Limit once per game. Elder sign effect you automatically succeed. After this test ends, either choose one, draw a resource, <laughs> draw a card, and get a resource. Or if it is your turn, you may take an additional action this turn. He has six health, eight sanity. His deck size is 30. He can take uh, zero to five mystic and neutral cards and zero to three blessed cards. And he's got his, uh, his his normal weaknesses and signature, but the important uh, last part to point out is that he starts the campaign with five experience points. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And if you're in standalone, here, you also get that extra five. Which is yes, sweet. it does, does not affect the number of weaknesses you need to take in standalone. Ah, oh, this is this is interesting. Okay, so he's got very <laughs> he's got very gym like stats, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So his and his ability Similar. is definitely definitely more bomb, but it is once per game. Mm-hmm. His elder sign effect, though, like Best I'm always game. clamoring. Yes, I'm always clamoring <laughs> for elder sign effects that still do something when you pull them on a uh, a non consequential test because. Freaking ninety percent of the time, that's where you, that's where they show up. Like, <laughs> I'm already three up on this investigate test. Elder sign. Like, the fact that he can then turn that little blessing into something substantial. Huge fan of that. Yeah, his elder sign effect is bonkers. Like, I, I like bye bye skids. Sorry, you held the yeah. title for a good long while. Skids is still, I think, second. Oh but... yeah. I mean, because the top half is essentially in the action economy. It, it's the same thing, right? You, you're getting two things, whether it be two cards, two resources, one and one. Um, but this can also give you an extra action. But so does Skids kind of too. Like, they're almost tied, but I feel like this one is a bit more versatile. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, having the choice helps. For sure. mm-hmm. And it doesn't have it doesn't have a limit either. So if you get like super lucky, I know this never actually happens, but if you get super lucky and pull the elder sign like two times in a single turn, mm-hmm. uh, and the fact that he can trigger like it, it, you know in those games you have those moments where it's it's at the end, you killed the boss, you're on your way out, you know you're trying to just get out or finish the last piece, and you're like, oh god, if I had one more action. Mm-hmm. If you haven't popped his ability yet, uh, you know, that, that remains a, a pretty cool possibility. And you know what? I think we're looking at the bottom part so much, we're totally skipping by the fact that you automatically succeed. Yes. <laughs> like, there's there's like, that. What does Skids do? Plus two or something? I can't mm-hmm. remember. I Plus two, gain two resources. Yeah. yeah. This one is like, you automatically succeed, even if you're like 14 under. That's... I love that. That's the thing. Mm-hmm. Do you believe in miracles? Is the <laughs> question. And you don't have to be playing skids to get this. So that's <laughs> another great. <laughs> yes, <laughs> another tick in the column. Yeah. That is a point against it. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> I am unsure how to feel about Father Mateo. Um, 
Mostly because I I like the ability and I think it fits with kind of this whole idea of like he's pulling off miracles <laughs> uh, each game. But uh, when you're not using it, I mean, he's the first investigator to have a once per game ability. And so it's like for the vast majority of the game, he doesn't have an ability. He has his elder sign effect, uh, but he doesn't have the ability until, you know, he just gets to use it once. So... He has the ability to have a grotesque statue in his "quote unquote" level zero deck. Yes, so the the XP is <laughs> just definitely... throwing that out there. <laughs> no, it's true. I mean, that's that's part of what fleshes him out. So it'll be interesting whether we get future investigators that start with that experience, or if that's going to be a special thing for him. And uh, the other thing is uh, the blessed cards, which do not exist yet. That's going to kind of determine a lot, too, of what Mateo's going to look like. That's because they're, they're meek and they're hiding, and they <laughs> shall inherit the earth. <laughs> they're, they're Just got to keep shooting baskets. <laughs> yep. Just, just catechism jokes all night. <laughs> there is one blessed card, and it's his signature strength. Sure. Or is it, yeah. But, yes, I, yeah. That, I think that's going to be, because, yeah, he's super limited right now. Um but depending on what blessed cards come out. What do you think the blessed trait will do? Like, okay, just pure speculation here, just based on the name of the trait, what we think that does in other games. I mean, do you think it's... I think it's solely just going to jack up your chances to win or possibly be auto-win things. Like, blessed cards make you fulfill conditions and then you just win. I feel like I'm going off of, like magic and i think of auras like i'm thinking of, okay. of white in magic right like it's gives you plus one plus one or whatever so whatever that is in this game um does it give you extra sanity or extra damage does it give you um maybe there's a blessed card that like stops an attack like it's like a yeah i don't know like is it calvin with his his signature card where there's like that bubble around him yeah i imagine a visual like that like <laughs> Hmm. A, a guardian angel or something but yeah it's tough because in the other like in say eldritch horror arkham horror the whole board game that is the uh, whole blessed and cursed thing is like basically increasing or decreasing your probability of succeeding but then i'm not i don't think blessed cards are necessarily going to do that here at least all of them because we already have other cards that do God, I hope so. I just, I just don't so I want don't the analog for cursed in this game. Cursed is, I friggin' hate cursed in uh, in Arkham Horror, the board game, and Eldritch. <laughs> it's just the worst. Maybe we get. No, I don't know. <laughs> I could just spitball all day. I was gonna say maybe like uh, increasing the chance of getting an elder sign, but I don't even know how that would work. Like treat another token as the elder side, and then when it comes up, that effect goes away or something. Hmm. Maybe it's like um, it would be an asset like the Codex of Ages that you can uh, seal the elder sign on. What, could that be a bless card? Possibly, and then like what discard the asset to use it in place of some other token just revealed. Yeah, and something maybe like that. Yeah, maybe while you have that sealed, uh, you get plus one willpower, right? Because you'd be blessed. <laughs> Could that be a thing? Well, we're almost there already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we might as well just go there. <laughs> okay, the Codex of Ages is a two-cost asset. <laughs> I would, uh, anyone good on Latin? Finis on omnium Finis omnium nunc est. <laughs> there we go. Uh, has the willpower and the, the wild uh, icons. It's an item, a relic, it's a tome, and it's blessed, guys. <laughs> Uh, Father Mateo deck only seals the elder sign. We'll get to that. Uh, you get plus one willpower while there's a token sealed here, and then reaction when you would reveal a chaos token from the chaos bag, discard the Codex of Ages, resolve the elder token uh, that was sealed here as if it were just revealed from the chaos bag, instead of re- uh, sorry, instead of revealing a token from the chaos bag. Yeah, so we should mention that. Uh... Oh, and also on a side note, uh, I was oh, kind of, of 
I was kind of joking with myself that uh, <laughs> Father Mateo's playlist that I'm going to make is just going to be 10 tracks of Gregorian chants. <laughs> 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 yes. But uh, uh, on a more serious note, the seal mechanic was introduced by this article. We've been talking about it a bit, but I haven't said what it is if you're not familiar. Uh, so the seal mechanic is basically taking a certain specified token from the chaos bag and putting it on the card, which means obviously that you're not going to be drawing that, whatever that token is from the bag, which is an amazing mechanic. I love it. Now Mm -hmm. I'm fairly certain though I haven't done the back research, but perhaps some recent or enterprising listener will. Fairly certain when we saw the grotesque statue at some point in the early life of this podcast, we were discussing the grotesque statue, and I thought about how cool it would be if you could grab a token from the bag, hold on to it so you can resolve it later. I, at that time, I was thinking like, "Hey, grab a skull so you know Agnes can do an extra damage when she you know wants to pull it on demand, something like that." I'm so so happy that this is a thing now. <laughs> yeah. Yes. It it's reminds cool me mechanic. of, yeah, I started recently playing Elder Sign and how you can like seal dice on a on a spell or how dice get put on uh, enemies and they, they get locked away. So kind of a similar idea. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, this just kind of, this is more or less allowing uh, Mateo to proc his ability again, right? This is like a doubling of his normal ability. But yeah. in the meantime, he gets the plus one willpower from it. Mm-hmm. But while taking the Elder Sign away from the rest That's of the true. group. So I just want to babysit the Elder Sign the entire game and never use it. So, uh, I, ultimate griefing. I mean, the other option, too, is you, you, if you even if you get this in your hand early in the game, you save it till near the end where you know you're going to need to Mm. pass a big test or something and you know like you let other people go and then you play this down seal the other sign go and do that test auto pass it get another action and then yeah profit Mm -hmm. yeah i think the other approach too is uh the kind of complete opposite which is instead of waiting for a key moment just just use it it's a free elder sign on yeah. anything it's gonna activate his ability or someone else's ability it's basically a test you're gonna know your pass for free i mean it's basically kind of doing what uh the uh, uh what's the bomb 5 xp card that does that elder sign automatically seal of the elder sign seal of the elder sign so this is basically like a lower cost no xp version of that uh, you're getting a free elder sign, so I would say just just use it. <laughs> Don't be shy. And you about start it. with five XP, so you could take that too. Yeah, you could. Yeah. This one is limited to you, though, with the codex. Yep. So. Oh yeah, good call. Good yeah. call. Great, uh, better in solo. Great for solo. I guess yeah. finis omonum nunc est means think twice before bringing it to multiplayer. <laughs> That checks out. <laughs> just, just take just, just my rudimentary knowledge of Latin from being raised Catholic. That's what I believe it to say. Yeah, so I feel like it's kind of cool. I feel like we're getting some different mystic archetypes develop. I mean, it kind of has for a while, but now it's really fleshing out that like Jim and Mateo are kind of going to be the more control chaos bag manipulation investigators in slightly different ways whereas you have like your agnes to be the the damage dealer and akachi's kind of all around so and what i love about this card is it has so many traits none of which actually matter to mateo as far as you know i'm sure <laughs> yeah. Re- i'm sure relic might mean something at some point to mystics in the future but he can't access scavenging for item to matter tome like daisy can't touch this and he can't he can't take the the librarian who goes and gets a tome yeah i just just thought that was funny it's like oh god we want to see tome more places where they can actually be used (laughs) hey we got another tome oh uh so he does have a wing uh weakness as well read this serpents of yig is a uh enemy has two fight three health two uh evade humanoid monster and serpent pray father mateo only hunter revelation search the chaos bag for the elder sign chaos token and seal it on serpents of yig 
So the serpents are going to guard that token until you kill them. Now, what happens if uh, you've already got the Codex of Ages out? They can't grab the Elder Sign at that point, right? I would say correct, because yeah, it's you could the search chaos the Chaos Bag, bag and <laughs> fail to find. Yeah. <laughs> so there's that. Yeah. That's... Yeah, you don't see too many investigators with a built-in defense against their weakness. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not uh, it's not too bad in the grand scheme. I feel like. And now that I've said that, one day the serpents of Yug will defeat my Mateo. Yeah. <laughs> three, he- three health, not nothing. <clears throat> no. uh, you know, as as a mystic who has low fight, Mateo is yeah. going to be leaning real hard on every one of those shriveling or song charges. Mm-hmm. So the fact that he's going to have to burn probably two of them to kill this guy, that's that's not nothing. Yeah, two charges. But if you have a guardian friend with you, like this is, <laughs> this is a cakewalk, right? Like, hey, my serpent's out. And he's like, yeah, I got it. I'm dead. <laughs> right? Like, it's two fight. Yeah, everything's better with the friend. Yeah. Having uh, can, your serpent can I out ask... will get you arrested in several states. <laughs> <laughs> can, we, can we have a quick uh, little compendium here on uh, on a podcast procedure? Mm-hmm. Um, I have no idea how to pronounce the name of the elder one for this this uh, campaign. So maybe we each take a different pronunciation so we have our bases covered. So like, I'll take Yig. Uh, Ian, you can take Yig, and Scott, you can take Yig. I'm going. <laughs> I'm going. Hidge. <laughs> Hidge. Hidge. Nice. There we go. All right. So yeah. So we do have uh, another player card that has the seal mechanic, so we can see a bit how this works outside of a special asset. So, uh, Mm -hmm. Sean, do you have the stones to read this one? Yeah. All right. Oh, nice. Sorry, I talked over your your excellent intro. (laughs) Um, So the Chthonian Stone is a level zero, three cost mystic asset. It has an intellect icon. It is the it has item, relic, and cursed traits. Cursed. Cursed. Not blessed. Seal a bad <laughs> stuff token. So skull, cultist, tablet, or elder thing. Forced, after you reveal a tentacle symbol during a skill test. So during a skill test specifically, that's important to know. Like mm-hmm. if you if you pull tentacle, you know, I guess during uh, hypnotic cases you would hope. It doesn't <laughs> trigger. If you reveal a tentacle symbol during the skill test, return the Chthonian stone to your hand. Not discard it. Mm-hmm. Toss it back in your hand, yeah. guys. Yeah. And, it does and, take up a hand slot, though. And it's only after you reveal it. Like, everyone else can be drawn tentacles mm, left, right, and center. Good point. Hopefully not. Now, all, <laughs> literally, all we need now in this event that says resolve a test uh, with a sealed token instead of pulling one from the chaos bag and this whole archetype that i've been hoping for is is on its way Mm. yeah Mm -hmm. this this is seems good to me i mean especially uh, going back to jam but you're playing carcosa there's three skulls which are uh essentially nullifying and then, uh, you know, there's only one other set of tokens, depending on until you get to the end anyway. Um, <clears throat> so you just conceal one of those. You just, I don't know, it seems like it's pretty good to uh, protect yourself. Yeah, and even in standalones, um, like I'm thinking of Ruguru, because I played that one recently. Uh, the elder, elder thing, there's only yes. one of them in the bag. And it's a brutal one if you draw it's it. It's nasty. Like, this is like, yeah, I'll just just not have to deal with that for a while so yeah also <sighs> potentially works with defiance if you're like sealing one defy the other mm-hmm. also just uh, problem and it's in a, it's in the hand slot so here, sorry i'll finish that thought first it's in the hand slot which for a mystic a hand slot generally not that contentious mm-hmm um you know maybe you're toting a fire axe maybe you're holding a grotesque statue maybe this in the other hand um but i think the problem with cards like this is that the benefit is imperceptible because it's not causing something from happening it is preventing a thing from happening and that's harder to notice Mm -hmm. harder to feel in your gut yes yes so so what i would recommend doing and i honestly don't know if this would actually mess anything on anything up but it makes sense in my head is uh maybe mark the token that you're actually taking out and every time you see it, 
you note that the Chthonian stone did something. Toss it mm. back, draw a second one. Mm. Yeah, that'd Just be a neat. thought. Yeah. Because then you could actually see it working as opposed to when it's like truly sealed, sealed, where you don't see it working. It's just, it's happening. Yeah, yeah that's very true. But in the, in the, in the, in the Father Mateo thing, you just have to have faith, Sean. You have to have faith <laughs> it's working. Baby! <laughs> Gotta have faith, the faith, the faith. Uh, <laughs> I uh yeah, I I think this is a good card. I'm looking forward to trying it out. I think that's kind of what you said Sean goes along with how people feel about Jim too, which is it's mm-hmm. hard to just see the probability manipulation going on or even if you do see it, you, it doesn't have as big an impact as other abil- more flashy abilities out there. And I play Jim. I, I whenever I pull a skull, I'm always I make a point to like fucking like sing about it, like skull. <laughs> yeah, Jim doing his thing. A careless blast, whisper, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> should just rig careless whisper to play every time a skull took <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, So that is Father Mateo the Seal mechanic. Looking forward. Oh, to we're work. really on Wham tonight, aren't we? <laughs> Yep, it's all about the, not a bad uh, place to be. It's all fun. about the George Michael. Um, I'm comfortable here. <laughs> that's, so that's about it for the seal mechanic. Looking forward to how that develops in the Forgotten Age because that's a cool new mechanic. Um, so Sean mentioned earlier that we got some news dropped today, and that is uh, some news specific to what's coming at Gen Con and Arkham Knights. And that is we're getting two new scenarios. So last year we got an epic scenario. uh, And we got the same scenario for both Gen Con and Arkham Knights. This time around we're getting two separate scenarios. uh, But they're not quite separate because one is leading into the other. So at Gen Con we're going to be playing the Eternal Slumber. Which is set in Egypt. That is! (laughs) I was intentionally leaving space for Sean to react there. <laughs> so the mummy scenario is real. <laughs> we're we're uh, approaching, uh, hopefully, some mummy shenanigans. We'll see what it ends up happening. I'm um, hoping it's just a play-by-play remake of the mummy movie. <laughs> <Yeah>. Just <laughs> archivized. I would play the ever-loving shit out of that. <laughs> and the second scenario is just the mummy too. <laughs> He's so good. And then the that Scorpion one I'd play King. like once and then forget how bad it was and then come back like five years later and then watch it again. <laughs> if Scorpion only we could King be... with the eyebrow trait. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if only we could uh, be so lucky. Oh, I see what you did there. Well, I will take that segue up and say that uh, the promo for Gen Con and potentially also arkham knights it's kind of unclear whether it's for both i read it as both i'm not sure but we're getting an extended art version of lucky is going to be our promo which is very cool because that's a card that gets used a lot (laughs) um so one of the other cool things is that uh the scenarios are tied together so eternal slumber at gen con we're gonna all be doing our thing and then based on those results that is somehow going to impact how people play the second scenario which is the knights usurper and that one is going to be played at arkham knights so uh it doesn't go into detail because they probably want it to be surprised but basically somehow how we uh, how successful we are at or what resolutions we have at Gen Con will influence uh, the Knights Usurper at Arkham Knights. And then, if that wasn't enough, how we uh, perform on the Knights Usurper at Arkham Knights is going to ter- determine uh, which of three different basic weaknesses gets added to the game forever. <laughs> so there's three <laughs> different potential ones. And two of them are just going to get thrown out, never to be seen again. And one of them is going to actually become a basic weakness in a future product. Uh, So again, they're not giving us information about what they do for obvious reasons, so it's a surprise. But one of them is called Aspect of the Beast. One is Abyssal Covenant. And the last one is Day of Reckoning. You know what would be awesome is if we all do just so bad, Matt's like, screw it, you're getting all three. (laughs) (laughs) i'll go ahead and recycle my joke from discord here that oddly enough was the lineup to my high school battle of the bands (laughs) 
Those all three of those would be very solid <laughs> band names. For sure. Um so Yeah, I think that oh, the other important piece of information is just if you're not going to either, then uh they're actually gonna get combined into one uh package called Guardians of the Abyss. So that's gonna be how it's sold at retail, and that's gonna have both scenarios in one. Uh minus the promos, that is. Mm-hmm. So important to point out that this is non-epic multiplayer. Yes. Which is fine. I'm excited. Which regardless. Yeah, which I'm actually happy about. Like I like Epic and that experience mm-hmm. with Labyrinth's Epic is still one of the best game experience I've ever had, I feel like. Mm-hmm. It was really yep. good. Yep. Uh, but on the other hand, I like having this one. You just have your group, you play it, and it also makes it uh the fact that you can inc- it's nice having more standalones that we can uh, add to our campaigns, which you can't really do with uh, Labyrinth's. To make Iron Man that much more iron. <laughs> <laughs> um, it also says here, each copy of the Eternal Slumber, both Gen Con and into the Invocation kits, uh, will come with the Extended Art promo, promo card. So even if you can't go to Gen Con, and I guess th- this will be the Invocation kit this year, uh, you'll mm-hmm. still get the promo there. So I think it's a different promo, though. Uh, I think we'll come with sure. an extended art promo card. Oh yeah, so there you yeah. go. And yeah, I'm extended. pretty sure it would be stepping out of a long-standing precedence for them to offer the same Gen Con or the same promo that they did at Gen Con. Yeah, uh, we'll have to wait and see on that. I I think it's cool that they are delving into this kind of story um, ramifications type thing, which Legends of the Five Rings was famous for in the kind of card game scene. And uh, I'm trying to think, uh, what other game? Oh, it was Netrunner, right? Where they had the two IDs, or was it three IDs? It was three, yep. It was one from each faction, and then they voted to decide. Right, and I think uh, Game of Thrones did something with uh, like a maester agenda and a knight agenda and something else. So it's cool seeing them bring that into Arkham and the cooperative world, because Lord of the Rings didn't really delve into that realm, but... Mm-hmm. Well, I love that it's based on narrative decisions we're all making. Yes. So it's not like we even know what exactly <laughs> we're voting for. It's just, it's taking, like, the temperature, the the narrative temperature of the community and deciding from there. Yes. So very cool. So, uh, yeah. That's about it for the news. Uh, next time we'll have a lot to talk about with the Forgotten Age in our hands. <laughs> oh, God, I suppose we will. Damn, I thought we'd have a bit of a lull, but... <laughs> nope. It's only been, what, two months since Dim Carcosa? Mm-hmm. Not that? Somewhere around there? I think so. Okay. Uh, so, Scott, we missed you on Rules PSAs last time. You got one this time? Uh, yeah, just a quick one. Uh... And I'm trying to rack my brain of the scenario when I really should have written it down. Um, but anytime you have, um, you know how like Wendy, if she has her amulet out uh, and you get the elder sign, you automatically pass. Um, mm-hmm. And then there's certain situations like drawing the tentacle where you automatically fail. Um, mm-hmm. There's also some, and we talked about this on the, when we, going from standard to hard slash expert episode where uh, some of the bad stuff tokens... It's like, if you're on Act 2, you just fail. Uh, Anytime you have something giving you an auto-pass and an auto-fail, which one do you think gets precedence? Hint, it's Arkham. Yeah, I was about to say, (laughs) it's going to be the fail. (laughs) fail. Yeah, so uh, if you ever encounter that scenario, um, I really should have written it down. But anyways, so if you get an auto-pass... Is it Olive? Is it which, sorry? Is Olive that scenario? Uh, so you draw Elder Sign, you draw Tentacle, and you draw Elder Thing that you absolutely don't want to resolve. Uh, yeah, sure. I you know pick the two of them. You I, pick the two, you know, symbol tokens to to resolve, and the Elder the auto fail takes precedence. Right. I think it has something to do with Stroke of Luck. Um, oh, and if you put in Stroke of Luck, and then you draw like I think it's the tablet in one of the scenarios, and it's like if you're on Act Two, you auto fail, but you have Stroke of Luck in there and you exile Stroke of Luck to auto-pass, you still auto-fail. So you wouldn't exile Stroke of Luck, obviously. But it oh, would... okay. Well, that's good. Yeah. Just like Flare in that way. Yeah. So if it doesn't hit, it doesn't exile. Which... I like right. Yeah. So anytime there's an auto-pass and an auto-fail battling it out, it's fail. So... 
That makes sense. A little more happy news for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't seem like there's... I mean, that's that's kind of the thing. It's like the tentacle token is bulletproof. Like, I don't think yes. there's ever going to be a card that lets you seal it. It would very much surprise me if there ever were. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, they are added uh, lucky dice to, to account for it. Like, it's just... Yeah. It stands. It was, it is, it shall be. Mm-hmm. And this is not just referring to tentacle too. Like it's any any automatic right failure. automatic thing. Yeah. So it's it's a bunch of super edge cases, but it was an interesting ruling. So I'll bring it up. Well, all right, all right, guys. So let's go on to Cosa. Tim lost car Cosa, <laughs> and wrap this cycle up. So. Starting out with Black Star's Rise. Any uh, player cards you guys would particularly like to call out? I, I call St. Hubert's Huber, Huber, Key. It's the Hubert's Key. It's so good. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. That's fair. Uh, I'll call Stick to the Plan. That is an awesome, awesome card to be able to pull out those <laughs> tactics and supplies. Like, just. Yeah. The consistency that offers is insane. Mm hmm. I ran it in my Slightning Gun Zoe. I was I, just going to say. Stocked, yep. yep, Slightning Gun Zoe. I stocked a quiche. I stocked, uh, I want to say, Prepare for the Worst. That's a tactic, right? Yes. It was either that or On the Hunt. And then I stocked an extra ammunition. And dear God, that deck just oh, got so consistent. Mm-hmm. Mm. Mm. <laughs> I, from you. Uh, I'm a fan of uh, Narrow Escape, the rogue event. Uh, not only because it has that fun art from the playmat. <laughs> yes, that the, is that is really good art. The crazy escape. I I like the in, the flexibility it gives you. That uh, rogues are obviously wanting to move around and uh, make things happen in unorthodox ways. So this one basically cancels an attack of opportunity and you get plus two skill value for the next test you perform this turn. So uh, what I like doing sometimes is it actually gives you the option of, uh, uh, you can intentionally trigger the attack of opportunity to get the plus two skill. Like if an enemy's engaged with you, you can move, so you get the benefit of dragging it somewhere more advantageous, and then you get plus two skill value to your evade to get away from it. Um, that's just kind of one example of what you can do. But mm-hmm. It is really nice for those situations where you go, oh, enemy, okay. Um, really, did those situations only happen to me? <laughs> no. Yeah, because you play Mystic. <laughs> <laughs> you play Solo Mystic. That's... <laughs> fair <laughs> you know kind of going down the list here this pack is a strong pack for player it cards. really really was like on the hunt is great because you get enemies <laughs> when you want them stick to the plan is stick to the plan uh guidance is amazingly insane as a support seeker you're like oh here have an action um narrow escape suggestion like i'm just reading off the list <laughs> of these cards and every single one like Maybe not without a fight. Ah, oh, I still is, like that card. Yeah, it's it's good, but I mean, like, someone has to come last to the Olympics, right? And I think that's the yeah, I suppose in this pack. Um, yeah, true survivor is good. Mm-hmm. Uh, Interesting. I'd have picked. I'd have picked guidance. Like that really pulls weight, huh? I, I honestly have not played with it yet, so maybe I that's have, why I've played a number of games with it, and it is insane. Like some because sometimes there's just you know, uh, a seeker's like, hey, I'm just going to investigate twice and I don't know what else to do. Here, have mm-hmm. an action. Sure. Like, it's... Yeah. Mark, take four swings at that big beast. Exactly. Right? Like, mm-hmm. when you're fighting that big bad and the seeker's just sitting there, it's like, well, I played my... I've got a plan. Uh, I guess I'll draw <laughs> a card and guidance. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, all right. Yep. The, uh, the... I'm going to have to pop that into the next multiplayer build I make. The one I'm maybe not as hot on is the upgraded Arcane Initiate. Like, I like the option, but it's just in Mystic, there's a, a ton of other stuff that I want to spend my XP on. And usually, I haven't found it too difficult to get rid of the Arcade Initiate and the Doom when you need to. 
Yeah, the cost reduction's nice, but yeah, I would agree. I think every time I look at it, I'm like, oh, God, if you were 2 XP, maybe. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. Maybe. 3 is rough. That's that's a good chunk, especially if yeah. you want to get two copies. Mm. Yeah. Which you probably do. <laughs> Which you probably do. <laughs> yeah. I, li- I like the upgraded ward, though, Like I, because sometimes 5 XP is a bit of a reach, but... Sometimes what I really need is just in two-handed or multiplayer the ability to cancel um, someone else's treachery. Mm-hmm. Well, this kind of it's like uh, what's it? Test of will in Lord of the Rings. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's more like that, right? Like it's just cancel a treachery, which right. I, like comparing because I know when Ward Five came out, I was like, eh, because it's like it's five XP. I realize you can cancel an enemy, but it almost felt like it was too, I don't want to say too powerful, but not powerful enough for 5 XP or whatever. I feel like Ward 2 is like right where I want it to be. Yeah, yeah that's a nice sweet spot. Well, because the thing with Basic Ward is it's a good card, don't get me wrong, but sometimes when I'm playing with more than one player, uh, then, <laughs> then uh, the Mystic is actually well equipped to deal with treacheries. So sometimes mm-hmm. the ward isn't doing much, and I really want it to help the other investigator deal with treacheries. Honestly, I usually end up dropping ward in most of my high willpower. Right. Yeah, high willpower builds. It it exists to protect you from the things that your willpower could, yeah, you know, most of the time otherwise solve. That might change campaign to campaign, but that's that's mm-hmm. what I've found so far. Okay. Uh, so then moving it on into the scenario itself, I think the, the notable setup for this one... Oh, yeah, okay, so hang on before we get into the encounter card stuff. Obligatory spoiler alert. <laughs> <Yes>. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if you haven't figured it out yet... God, we're so bad at doing that up front. If you haven't figured it out yet, uh, we're going full spoiler mode on everything mechanic, uh, mechanical and narrative that we can think of for Black Stars Rise and Dim Carcosa. So if you haven't finished the campaign that campaign yet, hit us back later. All right, amply warned. Mm-hmm. Okay, so uh, the setup for this one, I thought, you know, we talked about it a little bit with Matt when he came over and chatted with us, but I, I really liked that mechanic of Carcosa being above or below. Mm-hmm. And the first time you set this up and you don't know exactly <laughs> why or what is happening, mm-hmm. it's so cool to find that out. That was a very, very fun organic game moment. Yeah, I liked the... Uh the the blind experience the first two or three times i played it but especially the first time when it was just the i have no idea what i'm supposed to do because there's no act card uh uh, my blind run was with agnes and she was just kind of wandering around like bumping into stuff because i was like i really don't know what the hell i'm doing uh and was not successful unfortunately but uh I, i i do like that kind of mindset that it puts you into of having to choose uh, how you're going to approach putting doom on the two agendas whether you're going to advance one or kind of hedge your bets yeah i found the same way like i mean i think we talked about this in our interview with matt but i just i defaulted to oh i should just um go get clues i guess clues are good like, I, <laughs> yeah. but i was totally lost i'm like the act usually tells me what i need to do and now Just I'm let lost. your muscle memory kick in. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> okay, clues it is. <laughs> is there one path you guys find yourself always guessing because you kind of want to guess one or the other, or do you mix it up depending on what your gut's telling you? I, I think I'm like 75% of it actually being the path above, and I'm like 30% on guessing it correctly. Hmm. Hmm. I find myself always guessing the path below. Uh, maybe because I'm an ocean guy, I like the ocean, but uh, <laughs> I am, I don't know, I don't know what my probability is now, it's its not right most of the time, I'll say that. <laughs> I, uh, I, I garnered a hot tip, or a pro tip from a fellow player, uh, that basically said, um, if you want to kind of game it slightly, is just choose one side, like whichever agenda you want. And just go hard on that one, and mm-hmm. you'll you'll figure it out which side it is right quick. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, and I'm not really sure. Point. I haven't kept track of my correct guesses or whatever. I just no. 
Yeah, I mean, there's a little bit in the scenario that works against that because, you know, there's the cultist set that adds kind of extra doom that kind mm-hmm. of throws predictability out the window, which is good in its own way. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I found my first couple times playing through it, I was super doubt, super doubt. So just like load up each side evenly and be like, oh God, <laughs> oh God, until I finally hit a run where I was intentionally going conviction. Mm. So I'm just like, all right, we're going up, baby. And just doing that for a reason other than thinking it was the right strategy kind of made me go like, oh, yeah, well, this this actually makes a fair few things easier now that I've actually busted one. As long as you can either deal with the bonus that enemies get or just stomach the fact that uh, ancient evils gain surge, yeah. you know, which has to be one of the worst effects ever. <laughs> if you can deal with that, then uh, then you're pretty okay. Yeah, that's the thing if you hedge your bets and are kind of trying to do one on this side and then one on that side then you have to deal with both of those effects and you have to deal with both the title terror and the rift seeker going into the deck at the same time Mm -hmm. so kind of the way i approach it these days is i try to go fast i'm not as concerned about getting every last xp uh i try to get into the abbey church as quick as like quick as i can and then you can basically go to one of those locations i can't remember the names off the top of my head one is the uh, Knights Hall Chapel of Saint Aubert. Oh wait, to 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 open the ways. Yeah, one is the Chapel of Saint Aubert, and one is the Abbey Tower. So once you go yeah. into one of those, you'll you know right away which way is the right way, whether it has just clues and no text, or whether it has text that'll tell you which way is the uh, the path. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel like this is one of those scenarios that. You may be tempted to get XP on cards. Yeah, but just don't. don't. Like, but just, don't. Fin- yeah. Finishing is winning. Like, just just get this done. Don't worry about XP. If you happen to get XP, great. But if if it says anything, I've made it a standing practice to remove the Delve Two Deeps after Pallid Mask yeah. from my decks. That yeah. should say a lot. Yeah, that was mm-hmm. basically the uh, big difference originally uh, when I was having very close games and I lost, uh, like I said, Agnes and getting close to losing uh, some other campaigns. It was because I was trying to do the usual, let me go around and collect XP. And then once I figured out the strategy of just get the clues you need to get into the building and then go from there and forget about, you know, the extraneous stuff, unless you're like super well positioned or something. I just, I, my head goes back to uh, Dr. Horrible's sing-along blog and him yes. in the laundromat. And I'm looking at these XP <laughs> locations that have clues on them. Like, I don't love these things. And he's yeah, walking exactly. into the church. Because yeah. <laughs> like, that's exactly how I play it now. I'm just like, I got enough clues. Okay, I'm getting the hell out of Dodge. It just, yep. Yeah. Yeah. I got especially that juicy looking carrot at the end of the stick of the wrong location. Yes. So if you if you go into the wrong location, it's just like ton of clues to experience. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was almost the demise of my Mark and Min campaign, and actually, I've actually been waiting to tell this story for like months <laughs> because I was waiting for us to talk about Black Stars Rise. But those two are, you know, usually the Guardian Seeker campaign is like the Rockstar campaign. Uh, but yeah. I, I was trying to get that carrot. I was going for all the XP. And then I kept drawing the tablet that uh, puts Doom on everything uh, mm. if you fail and keep drawing tentacles to accompany those. So yeah. I went from like one or like none or one Doom on... Uh, the uh, the agenda that was going to advance to make me lose within a few turns that jumped all the way up to seven six or seven uh whatever the 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 threshold is like right before it <laughs> so i had to hightail to the location said forget the xp so they almost lost so i was like okay well i have min with the full rig and she's just gonna eat up these clues like no problem right the, the, I, I have one turn to do it but okay so she draws the freaking treachery that uh, I should really look up these card names in advance. Uh, let me see. Uh, Crashing Floods. So that is the agility test that if you <laughs> fail, she takes three damage and loses three actions. 
So suddenly I had my Seeker lose all three of her actions on my final turn before dooming out. Uh. So I was like, okay, now I have Mark with two Intellect against a three Shroud location. I'm like, yeah, this is, uh... That, that's about all she wrote. So I had th- Sophie, I, help me, honey. I had three tests to get three clues at one below. So I was able to use a combination of Sophie to get plus one. So I draw a negative one on the first test, got a clue. It's like, Ooh. okay, I have enough cards to go up to plus one on the last one, uh, on the second action. Uh, and then that was a negative one. So I was like, okay, the (laughs) odds are just freaking ridiculous at this point. There's no way. So I was like, okay, last turn, I only had enough to go up to zero. So I'm like, there's no way. So I take out the last token and I had to like actually get up and walk around for a little bit with it in my hand because I didn't want to look at it. (laughs) And finally I uncurled my fingers and it was blue. I drew the elder sign on the last one. And wow. somehow, Mark got three clues at, at two versus three, you know, going plus one each time. <laughs> and, and dragged Min's unconscious <laughs> up through the portal. Yeah I, yeah, I don't think I'll ever top that moment. That was just a miracle, pretty much. <laughs> Did anyone else uh, completely overlook the fact that the Rift Seeker... Seems to be a Biaki, right? Because it even has the Biaki trait. Yes. It has a little dude riding on his back that's also a, a cultist. <laughs> I totally and overlooked that's why it has the, the dude riding trait. on him, yeah. <laughs> I totally thought it was just like a stray feather or something. <laughs> like he was like it was a molting Biaki. But lo- uh, there's a little dude up there. He looks like he's having the most fun of anyone in the Carcosa campaign. Oh, <laughs> 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 <Full> cool! <laughs> Because it's certainly not the investigators having fun. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I like okay. that you can parlay the Rift Seeker. Yes, that's that's the other thing I was going to say is the big bad kind of non elite enemies. Like the the title terror starts really far away from you by the time he shows up most of the time, mm-hmm. and the Rift Seeker you can parlay away. Honestly, like they make you think about it, but I've never found either of those enemies to be particularly threatening. Yeah, no. Tidal Terror, I mean, if you can evade him once or twice, he's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, so talking about resolutions on this bad boy, uh, so this is much like Where Where Doom Awaits, I suppose. You you get through to Carcosa, or you don't. Yeah. That's that's what you get. (laughs) You go up, you go down, or you wake up on Tatooine. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's fairly straightforward. I'll, I'll say after having played this quite a few times that I think Where Doom Awaits is still the more difficult gatekeeping scenario. I think, not that it, this is a cakewalk, but I think once you kind of get a hang of Black Star's Rise that I haven't had as many close calls as I feel like Where Doom Awaits is still, uh, still can get you. <laughs> it's that hill, it's that base of the hill, the, the yep. central locations, man. Like if you fail the one shot you get to get a new location out. Yep. Oh, uh, it's basically like Ancient Evil's hits. Right? Cuz you cuz you lose a turn. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The chance of progression. Yep. You guys are making me feel like I'm saying crazy things. <laughs> I feel like I'm being fairly tame for me. Maybe you're just a unreliable narrator. Ah, oh, don't don't you gaslight me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so, any any uh, thoughts you guys had on the the ye old resolutions? I, I mean beyond. I felt like I expected exactly the resolutions, as in we're gonna continue or we're gonna die. A la mm-hmm. we're doing weights. So. Yeah. And yes, we did. I do like how the resolutions, uh, as we start to talk about Dim Carcosa, how you start at one end of the map or the other, depending if you went above or below. I think that was just a cool little, I don't know, change up. Oh, yeah. Like, that that flavor hit me. I was like, oh, that's that's neat right there. Well, it so. just makes it, it makes it feel like a continuous narrative, like mm-hmm. a legitimately continuous narrative. Yeah. Because it is. Uh, okay, so then on to Dim Carcosa, where the cloud waves they break ever closer. <laughs> uh, 
Any player cards you guys would like to mention? We got some bomb cards in this pack. Well, there was one. Uh, we talked about it, but this is one uh, I wanted. I had opened this, and or no, I saw it as a preview. And Sean, I wanted you to open the pack while on chat <laughs> with me because I wanted to get your which we, which we did, which was Charles Obel, because I thought that was just amazing. I have a serious Obel addiction going, <laughs> and I fully expect you guys to be having an intervention for me at Arkham Knights if I make it, because... Uh, hey, if you don't touch my Delve Two Deeps, you can have your Obel. I have just used this in every rogue deck, or a deck that can take yeah. it, since it's come out. <laughs> Y'all got any more of that Obel? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I feel like if I take this, it's just going to increase my propensity to randomly cheat. Which I'm trying to train out of myself. Mm. Um, how many campaigns have you had ended by this? None so far, knock on wood. Uh, but the thing is, it's, uh, again, where this card came out after I had kind of gotten Carcosa down. So it'll be a much different world if I'm doing like a, a solo fin run through Forgotten Age and I have no idea how to game the scenarios and I have Obol going. Like, I think that's where it can really come back to bite you. Yep. Or if you're playing like on Hard or Expert, uh, I would be a lot less yeah. cavalier about <laughs> taking the Obol, I think. I haven't played the Obel yet because I've only been playing on Hard and Expert. I'm just like, <laughs> right. right. <laughs> yeah. I know where this leads. <laughs> God dang. I, I, I feel like Carcosa gives me enough of a run on Standard that I haven't needed Hard and, and Expert yet. Dim Carcosa is just so intense. Mm-hmm. Anyway, we'll get there. Um, I think Rogue took this pack by far. Like It's got the Lupra, which I think is yeah. just amazing. And Cheat Death. <laughs> yeah oh my goodness it's a great card i mean it's yeah. it's kind of xp intensive but mm-hmm. you know once once you get both cheat death and karen zobel uh you know that's uh i mean do you go that way do you spend that much on that on cheat yeah, death do, right? oh if you have yes. obel yeah you you yeah. want cheat death because that what does that what does that replace does that replace like your i'm out of here i think you take both <laughs> i think you have two cheat death two, <laughs> two i'm out of here <laughs> That's the way I'd play. <laughs> Aren't you just eating your extra XP from the Obel, though, if you take that many Cheat Death? Probably. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Cheat Death, I think, is just yeah. a good card, even if you don't have yes. Obel. Because you That's heal true. so much, and you discard cards in your threat area and all this stuff. Like it's... And it's a free move. Yeah. yeah. Um, oddly enough, I'm going to give a pretty big up to uh, Level 2 Newspaper. Mm. Mm, yep. Because, A, regular newspaper has been just kind of gradually growing on me. I was pretty lukewarm on it to begin with, and, you know, in certain situations it was fine. Now that I've played a little bit more solo, I have a much better uh, appreciation for it. But just a little one-cost hand slot that can just boost any investigate action that you succeed on. Mm -hmm. With how many scenarios we have now that kind of have you spend down clues as you go, Mm -hmm. like, it's just so good. And honestly, I find newspaper really great in true solo because, like you said, we spend down clues often. And in true solo, there's not that many clues, right? It's like, oh, one per investigator. So you're like, okay, so one, right? And right. So you maybe only have to get two or three clues to advance the agenda. And if you're now at newspaper level two, it's like, okay, so if it's a single location with, like, let's say two clues, you discover them both, you move on. Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah, I I actually popped a one of uh, of this in um, in that Agnes deck that I was talking about last time that I was playing alongside Carolyn because Carolyn was kind of support, kind of clovery, but Agnes still needed to pick up some slack. So I had Right of Seeking, and then I had yeah, you know, started out as Flashlight, and then I upgraded to Newspaper. And what's cool about it is that Newspaper, even when you're not using its intellect, say I've got Right of Seeking out. You can still snag an extra clue from Red of Seeking if there's enough clues there. So you could grab mm-hmm. three off a of Red of Seeking charge uh, if, if, you know, if there's enough to grab. So, you know, yeah. it's unassuming, but I really like level two newspaper. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> See, I think we have to talk about the key 
which I just always call the key because I'm not sure if it's key of ease, key of ease. East. <laughs> the and key. I'll say key of ice, and that way we have all three of our bases. We have it covered now. <laughs> um, yeah, this is a uh, it's a You're the card. key of ice. <laughs> there it is. Willing to sacrifice our deck. <laughs> so this one gives you plus one to each of your skills for each horror on it. With uh, you basically can go up to three, and when it gets discarded, then it uh, discards the top ten cards of your deck. But this card is so powerful that it has generated a whole thread on Reddit of people discussing whether it's broken or not. Key point, uh, if you think a card's broken, don't play it. Don't ruin it for the rest of us, please. <laughs> Thank you. Good day, sir. I don't think it's broken. I think it's got a self-limiting power. I think it's very strong. It also costs 5 XP and 3 resources. Like, it costs a lot. And then... right. It self limits, right? Like you can get up to plus three, and then the next time you take a horror, it's gone, and it takes ten of your cards off the top of your deck. Now, as a like an avid card player, the top ten cards off my deck, I'm like, well, they could have been the bottom ten cards, so I'm not too worried about it. Depending on the campaign, because if you're in Dunwich, it might be really bad. Um, yeah. And with this game too, like you just res- you just shuffle your deck back, and you take a, a sanity, which you might have another key out. And then it just perpetuates, you know. So I, I think it's absolutely fine the way it is. I think it's a great card. Um, I think it's pretty well balanced. I mean, I just think it just becomes really powerful in an investigator who can afford Peter Sylvester. Mm-hmm. Right. I think survivors because it are, just protects it so hard. Yeah, survivors are well equipped between like the 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 keepsake and Peter to just protect it, but. Yeah, I, I'm with you, Scott, that I think it's very powerful. I think it's one of the most powerful cards in the game, but it's a 5 XP card for mm-hmm. 3 costs. Like, it's... I mean, we can... People will fall on different uh, ends of the spectrum on whether they think it's too powerful. But for me, in card games, broken is always something different. Broken, to me, is something that's just, like, totally warping the game to the point that it's not functioning the way it was intended and i don't think the key is doing that it's just super powerful mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and i think my my perspective has changed a lot playing a lot of i keep on bringing this up and i'm not trying to be that guy but playing a lot of hard and expert i mean i don't know i would take this an expert because the horror comes so hard and fast that <laughs> i'm only gonna get to use the, like this at like plus two for a turn or two right like yeah, if you if this is really good on on standard, once you hit expert, it's really hard to balance it. And I think my XP would be better placed elsewhere making my whole deck more reliable than putting it all all my eggs in one basket on this key. Yeah, cuz the thing is it's not like it's actually I feel like it's more than 5 XP cuz if you're going to make this part of your strategy and get value, you can't really take one. Like, uh, speaking from experience, I had one in my Windy deck for a few scenarios, and I just didn't see it. Like, unless you have strong card draw or ways to fetch it, then maybe that's different. If you have, like, Seeker access, then uh, maybe you can get by with just one, because you can dig for it. But otherwise, like, you kind of need two, and then you're spending 10 XP on that. That's mm-hmm. that's a huge chunk there. And, like, uh, who is it says in our, pod- in our channel here? Uh, the Black Horror. In a four-player game, only one person can have it, right? Like, that is, yeah, I think that's a balancing part of it, too. Yeah, so. I, I, I did see some arguments of people saying in multiplayer that the reason they didn't like it is because then the key investigator was, like, a god, and <laughs> and basically the other investigators just felt like they weren't contributing as much. I haven't, I can't speak to that because uh. I haven't experienced that yet. But that investigator still only has three actions out of twelve in that sure. game right like yeah those three actions are probably really good but there's nine other actions that need to happen each turn and the game <laughs> right. is then balanced for those 12 actions right so right good point consult your doctor if the storm rages for more than four hours. <laughs> <laughs> the good thing about the key is as i mentioned with windy early is it happens to be very good for the scenario it comes in mm-hmm. <laughs> yes yeah <laughs> <laughs> yes very yes <laughs> yeah. 
God, I don't even... Okay, this pack has just a ton of bombs. We're going to be talking about it all night. Let's move that to the AV Club that we'll do in a year from now. Um, Let's time warp it to the AV Club. <laughs> and, <laughs> oh, God, time warp. Yeah. No, we're not going down that rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, that is that is a rabbit hole, to say the least. <laughs> All right, so you know, I know we actually covered a lot of the story implications last time when we talked to Matt. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, you've got a different act two based on where you fall on the doubt conviction spectrum and whether you have a little of both. Just trying to think, there's not a whole lot else to discuss aside from the scenario itself. Which I have to say, this was a really satisfying ending. I like this a Ooh, lot yeah. more than Lost in Time and Space. It was hard as fuck, and it has a couple cards that I really hate, but overall fantastic closer yeah i felt this one i felt like i could interact with it a lot more whereas i found lost in time and space true to its name i felt lost right like you're just, <laughs> locations yeah. are left right and center and you have to know which locations to go to which to get to the next thing whatever this one is just laid out and you're like it goes back to the basics of the game except for the fact you can't die by horror um but get clues And then once you get clues, you can advance, sort of, by flipping the locations. And it's like, oh, things happen. And as soon as you flip your first location, you kind of get it. And then you're like, oh, sweet, I know what to do. And then you continue on. I think it, yeah. Way, I don't want to say way more fun, but a much more satisfying ending, I found. Sure. Yeah, I feel like... Yeah, I definitely like it as kind of the cap to the campaign. And I feel it's definitely harder than Lost on Time and Space for my money. Um, There's a lot more knockout punches, I feel like. Although I had a a couple of bad luck runs of Lost on Time and Space. But but that being said, I think this feels more like... Because in all of my runs, I've still never taken Odd Yogg, Sothoth. So I actually liked the... uh, being able to confront Hastor and that it is mm-hmm. this kind of final showdown that you have to do one way or the other. Do you guys have a favorite or least favorite version of Hastor to, ta- to tangle with? I really like the one where he's present everywhere and he, like he's just off. Doubt. I think it's Doubt, yeah. And he's just yeah, off to the doubt, side. Yeah, King and Yellow Hastur. Yep. Yeah, that one I liked a lot <laughs> honestly i think i think that one was the most interesting for me too where it was he felt distinct right mm-hmm. and the other ones he he's still impressive he's still a huge threat but he at the end of the day he's just a big monster yeah you right yeah yeah when he's or om- as omnipresent elder god right like he's just <laughs> yes yeah I feel like it really depends on investigator, but in terms of which one is like easier to handle, and I put that in quotes because I, I, like I said earlier, I think it's a difficult scenario overall. But I think conviction is probably the easier route because you just have to have a solid game plan once you know what to expect of how to knock them out, which can still be ruined by bad treacheries and draws. But with the doubt run, uh, it's. You know, I, I, like I said, though, it depends. If you're set up to be a cluver, then that's probably the way you should go. And if you have high willpower to keep evading him. And I mean, I think we'd be neg- neglectful if we didn't mention the possession cards. Because oh, mm, those yes. those were great. <laughs> like it just, yes. They're so good. That was definitely the payoff to the hidden mechanic we were all hoping for. Because... You know, the the voices in your head, they, you know, they definitely made some interesting choices and, you know, you draw the wrong one at the wrong time. It's like, uh, but these ones were like, Ooh. yeah, Ooh, right. <laughs> they yeah. even had some of that hidden tr- traitor stuff where you have to like deal two damage to an investigator. Mm, and... Murderous. <laughs> yeah. And, and you make you may commit this card to a skill test at your location. <laughs> it automatically Traitorous. fails. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's good. The thing I like too is they have both mechanical implications of like that because otherwise you can just keep racking up horror forever. It's going to make your game harder, but you'll survive. But they introduce that hard cap, which puts kind of a time limit on things. Uh, but then mm-hmm. also story wise, of course, it, it influences to the point where with Windy, I could have finished off Hastor one turn earlier, but I took the extra turn to get rid of the last possession she had because I wanted her to have the good ending. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
So I feel like, okay, as we move into the, the other gameplay stuff for this one, if I had any tip that, that I would want to pass on, is that I feel like you max out on your encounter card cancels in this scenario. Because mm-hmm. if, if you don't already have them in your deck, spend whatever measly XP you got out of Black Star's Rise. Get those Test of Wills, get those Wards, get those Four Warns, whatever you have access to. Because, dear God, there are some backbreakers in this one. Yeah. yeah. I'm I, looking at you, Realm of Madness. You know what I found worse than Realm of Madness, which is insane, is the final act. Because it's like, uh, what's the one we all hate? Goodness, now I, I'm blanking on it. That puts It's a, like souped up ancient evils with Surge. Yeah, it's like, it basically <laughs> says, double ancient evils, Surge. Well, I'll just keep some sanity around. It's it's fine. I guess, but that's, <laughs> don't same, spend it so quickly. Okay, same thing with Realm of Madness. Just don't go insane <laughs> in the land of right. insanity. Okay, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Pro tip, Sean. <laughs> oh. The one that has earned my hatred is Dismal Curse, which was single-handedly <laughs> responsible for ending both my solo skids and solo min campaigns by knocking them out with damage. Oh, mm, four damage! Hate dismal curse. Yeah, <laughs> it's so bad. Four freaking damage. <laughs> yeah, it's essentially test willpower five, four damage if you fail. That's, yes. Like if that it's... were printed anywhere else, we'd all be going like, "Oh, what the hell!" <laughs> so bad. I. So any other any other play tips for this one? Do you guys have a specific route that you go on? Like, I feel like I'm just. Going wherever I think I can get a damn clue. Yeah, I think it's just get clues. Like, yeah, I, flip I don't think there's a, Do things as quickly as you can so there's less mythos phases. My biggest play <laughs> tip is uh, I go to the palace first and get those as the initial clues. That way I have... Basically, I want to get that explored earlier because I've gotten caught in the... Uh, the other reason solo skids went down is because I didn't do that, and then that stupid beast was there along with Hastor, and it's like you have to find a way to get past them to get the clues so that you can discover the secret, and it's just all bad at that point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But uh, I, I find the pacing of this one interesting, because it's not one where you don't want to rush it and not be set up because you need a lot of good cards for the showdown, but then you also can't take all day in your time because the scenario will push you and knock you out if you're dawdling. I mean, if you get too much horror, the skulls basically become... Auto fails. Yeah, no, they're, they're <laughs> only minus fours on, on standard. Uh, yes, on hard, Scott, they are definitely auto fails. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they're minus the number of horror on you. <laughs> yeah. Ugh. With no cap. Nope, no cap. Uh, in the one I was playing recently, the expert one, I know there was at one point I drew a minus 12. <laughs> like it was... <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay, well, yep. Cool. The game's just like, hey, message fuck you more. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, okay, you don't want me here, I get it. I'll leave. I think part of what makes this one difficult, uh, I was just thinking about this, compared to the rest of Carcosa, they had pretty big maps, which I find in general make things a bit easier, at least for the kind of investigators that I play a lot of. (laughs) Uh, But the small maps, I think that's why this and Curtain Call to me are still the hardest scenarios in this in this uh cycle because those small maps they don't give you much room to maneuver especially when Mm -hmm. it starts filling up with all those big uh fighty monsters there's what seven locations in this one is that typical what is our average number of locations per scenario has anyone ever calculated that black stars rise had uh six i don't have my Mm. other inserts but yeah i feel like that's got to be somewhere around yeah i I think also the shape of this map makes it hard That's to That's true. Maneuver. It does have bottlenecks. Yeah. Yeah. It just has that one hub, kind of, and if something camps there, it makes it hard. Yeah. <laughs> like the creature out of Dimhi. <laughs> yep. That yeah. one's fun because he sits on the, the hub location and then pops in to attack you if you, get a, if you flip a location adjacent to him. 
Yeah, or he the, looks like evil Horton. <laughs> the winged, and he heard a who. <laughs> <laughs> the winged one moves towards you if you flip location over, and it mm-hmm. deals three damage at a time. Yeah. Yep. Three damage and a horror with retaliate. With retaliate. <laughs> so don't yeah. fail. Yeah. Yikers. I guess this is a good one for shortcut too, though, with all those hubs, right? Everyone's yeah. a good one for shortcut. <laughs> just, just throwing that one out there. Every scenario likes shortcut. I disagree. <laughs> Essex County Express. Oh, still good in multiplayer. <laughs> I think we're talking about upgraded shortcut, right? Yes, because yes. I yeah. would say that Essex is probably like. Anyways, that's completely. Not here. <laughs> oh, and I do really like sneak attack for this scenario. Again, Tesla's damage on Hester is. Worth its weight in gold. Oh man, upgraded sneak attack. You can just deal two damage to him, can you? Can you? Yeah, as long as you're not engaged with him. So he could be God engaged damn. with someone else. Hmm. Oh, what do you know? I feel like that's cheating. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so then talking about wrapping this bad boy up, we talked all about the implications of finding out who the man in the pallid mask was and all the narrative stuff when we talked with Matt. So resolutions here I thought were really cool. Mm-hmm. You know, if you if you went the conviction route, you were right. If you went the doubt route, you were right. But that epilogue, man, that epilogue is so fucking epic. I love that thing so much. Are you talking about How do you guys feel about if, the epilogue? If you still have the uh if you still have, if, uh, the... if anyone had possessed in their hand at the yep. beginning of the, at the end of the game, and only those people read the epilogue, <laughs> yeah, yep. yeah, that was I liked that a lot. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> oh, it was such a satisfying resolution. I forgot to tell you how my Skids and Daisy campaign ended up. So they actually defeated Dim Carcosa. Wow, uh, doubt route. Um, but Skids was not possessed, and Daisy was. So, all along, Skid's the one who always ducked out and was unreliable, and I'm out of here, was uh, on the straight and narrow, and Daisy was the traitor, after all. Now, is that because Skid's can't read? <laughs> I think it's because because he was constantly getting out of the, the scenario, he was exposed to fewer H-rays, and we all know H-rays are what make you crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's enough. very scientific. Yep. <laughs> But yeah, I love the whole looping, like, that you're just continuing the cycle, which we talked about with Matt, and then I was thinking after the fact about, oh, that really ties in with, like, that was a big theme in True Detective, too, which is uh, how things just oh, I re- need to rewatch that. repeat, and time is a flat circle, and all this uh, crazy stuff. Mm-hmm. So... Guys, wrapping up thoughts on Path to Carcosa, because the next time we record, <laughs> oh boy, <laughs> the Forgotten Age will be upon us. What a campaign. Yes. Like, I feel, mm-hmm. and, and I think uh, anytime you listen to Matt speak about uh, Dunwich and stuff, it he makes it quite clear. He's like, the game wasn't released yet, and I'm making a campaign, so he kind of <laughs> played it safe. Like, I feel mm-hmm. like this one, he's just like, well, I'm throwing everything out the window, and I'm just going to do some crazy stuff, so... Cracks knuckles over keyboard. Yeah. <laughs> I I absolutely loved it. And the fact that, that the thing he always talked about with the un, unreliable narrator, I totally felt that, and I loved it the entire way. Yeah, I'll say I was super excited when this, the cycle was announced, because Hastor is also my favorite ancient one. But uh, there's always that little bit of, like, anxiety of whether it's going to meet expectations. But for me, it did. It was an amazing campaign. I I will echo everything you guys both have said. Uh, I feel like this one really stretched the narrative quality of Arkham. It, uh, you know, Dunwich was, was pretty meat and potatoes... Did some cool things, but pretty as expected with what you know you saw printed in the corset. Mm-hmm. But the the doubt conviction paths, the the fact that you never quite knew what was happening, like you have weird random flashbacks <laughs> yeah. that yeah. seem like hallucinations, but they're also eerily like memories. Uh, the dream sequence, 
Yes, the dream sequence. Like, wow. So many just cool things done with within the format of ink on cardboard. Yeah. Like, yeah. at the end of the day, we're pushing pieces of cardboard at other pieces of cardboard. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I really have struggled to think of any other tabletop game I've played that has done something similarly or as successfully in terms of the narrative as this cycle did in terms of like unreliable narrator stuff and I think it's how this game is set up with the campaign and all that that lets it do that but it's really quite a thing (laughs) yeah I'm I'm anxious to see where we go from here like with the Forgotten Age Um, because this just seems so good I'm like what else can happen? <laughs> but I'm sure Matt has a plan, so. I will be very excited if Return to the Night of the Zealot sells really well to the point where FFG is like, we'd be stupid not to do a return for each cycle. Mm-hmm. If we get Return to the Path of to Carcosa, like, I will be uber excited to run through this again with some remix mechanics. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Get some they... new versions of the VIPs. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I would wonder if, um, like, the, what do you call it, the possessions in the final scenario, if it's like, you can only win if the other investigators die. <laughs> like, something like that. Like, just amp up the possessions and the, the hidden cards. Like, even in the first the first couple scenarios, just like, when another, when another, like, you can't do something, when another investigator dies, you can discard this card. That'd be so sweet. <laughs> I, I imagine there's crazy things to be done, and oh, we'll have crazy yeah. player cards to play against it at that point. Mm-hmm. Like, mm, yeah, mm, I really, I really hope that uh, that future exists for us. So, everyone, buy a Return to the Night of the Zealot, please. <laughs> yeah, that's the moral of that story. <laughs> <laughs> buy multiple copies. <laughs> you guys have I a did. favorite scenario from the cycle? Ooh, I think I'm between Phantom and Pallid Mask. Mm. I think I, is echoes the what's the insane asylum one echoes unspeakable oath 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 I think oath what yeah is? it's between oath and pallid for me and I think I just n- give the narrow edge to oath it just I was I've been wanting in a, a asylum scenario and it just delivered exactly what I wanted yeah. from that experience haha <laughs> straight jacket <laughs> <laughs> you, honestly one of the best designed treacheries in the like, <laughs> if i were to pick one of my favorites not because i like liked having it happen but i was just like yep that's exactly what it is um <laughs> yeah right up there with uh oh god what are they called the birds from dunwich oh the whippoorwills, whippoorwills. Yeah. yep just amazingly designed cards yep yep agree <sighs> all right well we we turned from carcosa with resolution renewed for the forgotten age <laughs> god damn i thought we'd have a longer break like i'm not complaining but i'm kind of complaining <laughs> i actually wanted time to like finish up all my carcosa campaigns mm-hmm. before the forgotten age came out not gonna happen i think i still have like three that i started but i'm never gonna get to finish just like happened the same thing with with dunwich so i suppose it's just just gonna happen <laughs> forgotten age comes out the day i leave on vacation with my family oh, oh no yeah yeah so poor baby <laughs> oh well um all right so let's move it on into a little bit of hotline catch-up first uh a first for for mythos busters hotline we have a misconnection misconnection <laughs> so this is this is a message directly for james who called in last time or anyone who, who's part of james posse uh, we have a listener, Lockwood, in our Discord who is going to be moving to Sarasota and would love uh, a chance to meet up with some people and play Arkham. So uh, he's he's out here in our Discord as Lockwood. Please go drop him a DM if you guys would like another player to play with. I can guarantee you he has his own collection, guys. He can expand your deck building options. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, so then from there, we only have one uh, one short little call to to catch up on the hotline um so this gentleman is going to go ahead and uh, oppose us a, a very well thought out and existential question huh? hello 
of this? <laughs> oh, that's so good. So, Ian, what the hell is this? <laughs> it's a question I ask myself every day when I wake up. <laughs> uh, so, it was bound to happen eventually. We were going to have a wrong number. And I just, I was so happy when I saw the voicemail come through. <laughs> <laughs> and saw that there was just enough of a message probably to catch some noises and uh, I was not disappointed at all. <laughs> so great. What do, what does our uh, answering message even say? I don't remember. Um this is I'm pretty sure it, I'm pretty sure it's <laughs> pretty explicit that uh it's like hey this is the Mythbusters hotline <laughs> try to keep your call uh you know 3 minutes or under and you know just kind of basic editing stuff that I put out there. But anyway, uh, so no new calls this week of, of note. So, uh, as always, if you have a comment, question, a bit of uh, degradation to throw our way, <laughs> please do call us at the Mythos Busters hotline. That's 203-493-6984. Guys, it's time for Tentacle Time. Yes. Scott, what you got? <laughs> so, like I said before the show, I'm actually excited for Tentacle Time this time. Uh, not that I'm not normally, but I have a bunch of stuff. So, uh, as I said last time, played a bunch of chess. Uh, got those all dark <laughs> bishops. So, uh, <laughs> actually, oh, yeah, it's hey, hang on, hang on. If you're into pimping, chess is a great place to be. There are oh, some true. amazing chess true. sets you can buy. You know what though? I I it I've I've curtailed myself, so I'm like. A year from now, I'm going to buy myself a really nice set, but for now, I'm playing on like a twenty dollar foldable board, and I'm totally cool with it. So, yeah. Oddly enough, I don't need to pimp yet. Um, last Star Wars LCG game ever was played. Well, the organized type, the worlds, uh, and the final game was Ewoks versus Imperial Navy Star Destroyers. So, yes, <laughs> nice. as well it should be. Um, and I. I uh, I won't spoil anything. I mean, everyone's gonna watch the the finale, but apparently it was a really good game. Um, <laughs> for any Arrested Development fans out there, I know everyone on the Mythos Busters podcast is a big fan. Uh, they, there are dozens of us. Uh, happy uh, Cinco de Cuatro <laughs> today! <laughs> uh, and today they released the uh, a new start uh, where they re-edited <laughs> season four. So it's more like the old ones. It's on Netflix or whatever. Um, and I already got the license plate. So uh, I hit Legend in Hearthstone. <laughs> so go cry in your pie. Yeah. I hit Legend in Hearthstone. I don't know if I already said this or not. It was a while ago, but I don't think I've been nice. on since I hit Legend. No, no, you had not. I, well done. I burnt myself out on Hearthstone. It's been like a month, and I'm just like, <laughs> I still don't feel like playing. I bet. <laughs> like a new expansion came out, I'm like, mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm sure it did. <laughs> oh, damn, that's hilarious. Oh. You've been playing that solid for like a year. Uh, I've played it since beta, like every day. <laughs> and I finally hit it, Legend. Uh, okay, so lastly... Oh, you found the bottom. Yeah, <laughs> or the top. Um, yeah. <laughs> hey, it's like, Depends on which way you're pushing, I suppose. It's like Carcosa, right? Uh, <laughs> so, last thing, a game that I will actually talk about, uh, Frostpunk. So... It's based on, the, the name comes from the word steampunk, but basically in the 1800s, the idea is there was a giant ice storm that froze a lot of the world. Um, a bunch of people from London moved out to this giant area of snow and found a giant crater and started building a city. And it's basically a, a city building survival game. And the thing you have to survive against is the cold. And so... On a default day, it's like minus 30 Celsius, minus 40 Celsius. Uh, yeah, and so you have to mine coal, get like wood and steel and all this stuff in this city. And you have this one reactor in the middle and it provides heat. But you have to upgrade it so it's it's like sends out heat farther into your little city. Um, your people can get sick, they can get frostbite, they can have limbs uh, chopped off because of gangrene and stuff like that. Um, at one point, uh, it makes you... The big thing about it is it makes you lo make a lot of moral choices. Like, one of the first mm. ones from the very beginning is, how do you feel about child labor? Because <laughs> you have 80 people, 20 of them are children. Do you put them in, <laughs> like, daycares? Or do you make them work? 
And then if you do make them work, do you let them work all the jobs or only the safe jobs? Safe with quotation yes. marks. <laughs> um, and then the the moral choices just go down from there because eventually you can create like you have to choose if you want to go a peaceful religious route and get people to like come together over religion and self building and stuff or do you want to rule them with order and then you have like guard towers and you have a ministry of truth like a propaganda center to get people on your side um one of the biggest moral decisions i had to make was at one point there is uh you can choose to have morning meetings to raise morale and basically indoctrinate (laughs) people um and at one point this kid goes just like walmart yeah (laughs) A child, and it, like all these times, these, these little windows will pop up and be like, "What do you want to do? What do you want to do? What do you want to do?" And the key thing is, they name everyone in the game. It's not just a worker, and of course, you can do. click on anyone and you can see their family, like who they're related to in your oh my town. God. <laughs> so this one kid goes out to this um, the snow pit, which is the cemetery. But I chose to instead of bury people, you put them in the snow pit, you freeze them so you can use them as fertilizer later. Um, <laughs> nice. He goes up to the snow pit uh, and demands that I make a town hall meeting that's big enough and loud enough that his mom will wake up and come to him, but his mom's dead. And so, oh, that hurts. And so I have to decide whether I devote resources to convincing him, like, okay, come back here, like, your mom's dead, or I teach him a lesson and, and leave him to freeze to death. Oh my god. <laughs> but <laughs> is that not more of a lesson? <laughs> but uh, like I feel like we're gonna teach him an execution. But, I'm gonna learn him today. <laughs> but it takes away from your production if you want to bring him back, and that might lead to further people mm. getting injured or ill. So you have to choose do I let this kid die? Or do I choose the moral thing and like bring him back in, but then we all suffer a bit? Anyways. It's an amazing game. <laughs> if you like touching on your moral uh, temperature, I don't know. No <laughs> this fun. was Steam, you said. Uh, it's on Steam. It's called Frostpunk. It's on. A, it okay. takes quite the computer to run. Like I have a gaming laptop, and like I'm running on low visuals. Um, Day Nine did a stream of it, um, and he had like he's a professional streamer. And he had some frame rate drops on low wow. settings. So, um, yeah, Mr. Trench. Wow, so there are some serious resources. I did not expect the production value to be this high. Holy crap. Yeah. Um, Mr. Trench, uh, it's the same people who made This War of Mine, if anyone played that. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So It looks gorgeous. It is beautiful. Like, <laughs> absolutely beautiful. Um, yeah. I, I just recently built the... Uh, execution square to keep oh. my people in mind <laughs> i went pretty dark <laughs> so so how many days until scott goes cannibalism <laughs> well it the game only lasts papers, like please. a month and a half or two yeah papers please <laughs> only goes about a month and a half or two months and then a final okay. storm hits and you basically have to survive the storm uh, and and the game ends so it, cannibalism <laughs> but it, it makes like a customized two minute cutscene at the end Based on all the decisions you made, how you built your city, all this stuff. Mm, it's super That's cool. pretty cool. Yeah. I kind of like really that it cool. doesn't go forever. You're kind of prepping for uh, yeah. the final showdown. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, and there's refugees coming in. You have to decide, do I bring you all in, only the healthy people, or stay the hell out? And let them freeze to death. Hmm. Yeah. Lots of moral decisions, and it's fantastic. You feel like a horrible person, unless you choose the good <laughs> things. <laughs> <laughs> Which I didn't. <laughs> Anyways, I wish I would. No, no, I just wish I had the uh, the patience for a game like that. I don't. I never play on my PC anymore. Is the first problem. You. I'm either. It probably only takes go. like honestly like eight to ten hours to play a whole hmm. game of it. It doesn't take a long time. So okay. Bad. I suggest starting I could, on easy. I could get on board with that. <laughs> you don't worry. You don't need to tell me that. I've embraced. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I actively fight my status as a casual player of, like, Lord of the Rings and Arkham mm-hmm. because I play them a lot, so I can't accept the fact that I'm kind of casual, even though I really totally am. Um, but I've fully accepted it as a video gamer. Yeah. I am not... Same. I have no shame for playing on easy mode. Yeah. 
even on easy mode, it's not easy. So, so I picked up Bloodborne because that is uh, <laughs> right along that line of reasoning. Oh, so you're a sadist. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Ian, what have you been up to? Uh, a few things, but uh, what I'll talk about is the main thing is uh, Infinity War came out. And as I have mentioned a few times on this podcast, I am way behind on Marvel movies. So I was like, okay, before I go see Infinity War, I'm going to finally catch up or get as close to catch up as I can and uh, hopefully avoid spoilers, which is uh, a tough thing. But uh, anyway, so I have gotten through three movies I haven't seen, but well, two and three fourths. So I saw Captain America the First Avenger for the first time. I got that one. And so that completed phase one, which I had seen all the rest, actually, which surprised me. It was in the later phases that I fell off. Blows my mind that you haven't seen some of those ones that seem yeah. so old. So that I know. It's all, like, cutting edge to me. I'm like, hey, guys, have you heard about this Captain America movie? <laughs> you heard about this newfangled movie, Captain America? <laughs> um, and uh, I understood that reference. So then I watched uh, Iron Man 3, which I had not seen before. And then I'm, uh, the three forces, I'm mostly done, I'm about three fourths done with, uh, the Winter Soldier, and I need to finish it, but, uh, I had to pause it, <laughs> but I will finish that I definitely one think, soon. definitely think Winter Soldier is the strongest of the Cap movies. Yeah, I obviously haven't seen the end of it yet, but, uh, I, I've really enjoyed that one. Uh, the first one was, was good, I enjoyed it. It was uh, fine. It was fine. And uh, Iron Man 3 I liked. I know that one got kind of... Uh, I remember the reaction was a bit divided on that one, but I liked Iron Man 3. Ragnarok's still at the top, though, right? Yes. I yes. Again, I haven't seen Winter Soldier yet, but uh, I have a hard time seeing if any movie's going to knock out Ragnarok for me. I just really freaking love... I think part of it is a genre thing, too. I'm kind of sad Nick isn't here, because I know he would be arguing hard for Winter Soldier. Yeah, as he does. But I just really like the fantasy sci-fi element of Thor and what they did with Ragnarok, and so I think that's why it takes it for me. I just like the fact that Ragnarok's first and foremost priority is, hey, this movie's fun. Which it is. Like, that's... Whatever else facilitates that, great. But this movie's just fun. That's the thing. Like most Marvel movies, I like, and yeah, they're they're good movies and they're fun, mm-hmm. and I watch them. But there's not a lot of them that I'm like, oh, let me watch them again. And Ragnarok, no joke. I watched it the day after the first day I watched it. Yes, and I've seen it's it three so times so far because it's yeah, it's just entertaining. Uh but on the docket now, I have up next. I have to watch uh, Civil. I have to watch uh, Avengers two. Uh, let's see. Well, you have not seen Avengers. No, nope. we've already had this conversation. So yeah, the movies I have to see are Avengers two, um, Civil War, Ant Man, and then I think I'm caught up at that point. Actually, I'm gonna predict. I'm gonna predict of those three you just listed, Ant Man's gonna be your favorite. I would not be surprised. I've heard it's pretty good. That's... I don't know. I tend to now like the Marvel movies that are a certain type of movie that just happen to be in the context of a superhero movie. Right. Where, like, you know, Black Panther's political intrigue that happens to be a superhero movie. Oh, yes. Black Panther is the other one I did not see. (laughs) You hadn't seen Black Panther? No, I did not see Black Panther. I know. I have not seen it either. That one's real good. Oh, there's two more I haven't seen. Never mind, I'm further by. <laughs> I've not seen Doctor Strange, which I have, <gasps> yeah, which I have owned on DVD for quite a while and just haven't watched it. And uh, <laughs> you I... own it and you haven't seen it. Yes, I <laughs> own it and I haven't watched it. So yeah, that one will be easy. So yeah, I'm almost there. <laughs> almost there. And Spider Man Homecoming, I have not seen. <gasps> that one's real good. I feel like the villain in that one is one of the best villains. Hmm in a marvel movie in a long time Hmm. just because he's so different from the rest of the cast interesting uh yeah so tangential to to ragnarok so i don't know if you guys have seen a little a little movie called what we do in the shadows uh it's a little a little mockumentary that uh taika watiti and jermaine clement of um flight of the concords fame did basically a mockumentary that follows three vampires Mm -hmm. 
who will live together in a flat in Wellington. <laughs> we're nice. werewolves, not swearwolves. Yeah. Come on, guys. We're werewolves, not swearwolves. Mary Hewitt, yeah. band manager. <laughs> He's the best. Yep. Anyway, that movie or that movie is amazing. If you have access to it, it's on Amazon Prime. I know for sure. Go watch it. It's just so freaking good. It's now becoming a TV show. What? And oh, here we go. Here we go, guys. This is this is the haymaker. <laughs> it's bec- it's becoming a TV show. And I read that they are either in talks with or have casted Matthew Barry, who is Douglas from the IT crowd. Who is my favorite character from the oh. IT crowd. So if you can imagine, like, a, like he, he's got to be playing a vampire, I assume. Can you imagine, like, a Douglas-type <laughs> character delivering lines that Taika wrote? Oh, God, I am so yeah. goddamn excited for that show now. That actually or, sounds great. Is he the guy that hangs around with vampires? Maybe. I, I don't care. That dude could read the phone book and it would be hilarious. Mm-hmm. He's just got one of those voices. It's him and John Benjamin. Doesn't matter what they say. It's just funny. Wow. I am super excited for that. <laughs> I didn't even know that was so, existing. So, Right? Well, it's, it's getting there. Happy- uh, so then the, other, the only other thing I wanted to mention is uh, between watching Westworld, which season two is off to a great start. Mm-hmm. Um, between watching Westworld and the new Red Dead Redemption 2 trailer dropping, that also looks amazing. I, I just had an itch that needed scratching, so I lugged out my PS3 and plugged OG Red Dead Redemption back in. Yes. <laughs> and, oh, man. It's it's not really lost much of its shine. It's still such a good game. It turns out I had a game going already, though, so I was like, you know, a third of the way through the story. Hadn't played it in at least three, four years. So dropping myself into that point in the story when I, like, don't know the controls and the, the difficulty level has already popped up to... <laughs> You know, we assume you're at a moderate level now. That was fun to drop back into, but now I'm I'm, I'm getting there. Like I I don't constantly try to use Shadow of the Colossus horse controls when I'm on my horse in Red Dead Redemption. But goddamn, <laughs> those are good games. It's making me so excited for that new one that's coming out. Yeah, the the trailer looks amazing. I uh, don't play many video games this day these days, but when that comes out, I'm clearing my schedule. I'm gonna play oh, the yes. hell out of that. <laughs> I'll be I'll be taking op- release day off probably, which is a thing I don't do anymore. I'm taking release day off for uh, uh, the Forgotten Age. Just FYI, mm. if either of you two happen to be around, I'm taking off out. on the release day. <laughs> oh yes, that's right. You mentioned that. All right. Well, anyway, that's all I had. I've been playing Arkham and Red Dead Redemption. Basically, a little bit of Borderlands in there. So. Guys, I think uh, that that wraps it up for us. Anything, any parting shots before we go? Scott, you will you probably not be on the next one we record because of said vacation? Probably not. We're going to be, be in okay. Montreal. Uh, I know we had a guy call in from Montreal. Um, so if you're in Montreal, please, you know, uh, either send me a message on Discord um, or message on our Facebook page. I'll get it. Maybe we can play a game. I'm not guaranteeing because it is a whole, like, it's my wife's side of the family. We're all going as one big family, and we rented a house and all this stuff. So, um, but maybe I'll have an afternoon or evening free. So maybe mm-hmm. maybe I can play the Forbidden Age or Forgotten Age. <laughs> It'll be forbidden from you for, for you. Yes, forbidden forbidden from you until you get back from your vacation. Whatever. Yeah. Joke dot exe has stopped. <laughs> Terminate. <laughs> Uh, okay, well, Ian, any parting shots from you? Uh, nope. Just uh, plugging away at a new Arkham Custom scenario, which I will talk more about in the future when it's getting mm. there. But this one is... I've not uh, even heard much about this, except for the fact that it has way too many locations. <laughs> yeah, it is rich with locations. So this is an original story rather than something that's based on a property. Although there has been some clamoring for a Stranger Things season two, which I will probably start working on after this one is done. Yeah, but that means you have to watch season two again. True. Just kidding. I like season two. I'm kidding. I was just trying to start a fight. (laughs) (laughs) We've been on too long. Uh, I'm not producing anything extra uh, for my part, except 
that everyone listening to this, hopefully you'll have seen one already, but ideally we are we are establishing a new system by which we can actually start to get the AV Club back on track. So if you're looking out for some in-depth card reviews, hopefully we'll be able to furnish those pretty soon. It sounds like it's good. It's, it's a system that's going to work, mm-hmm. uh, so just pay attention to those. If you haven't subscribed to that other feed, it is at the Miskatonic AV Club, uh, wherever your favorite podcasts are served. All right, guys, well, that's going to wrap us up for episode 37 of Mythos Busters. We'll uh, see you next time. Meh.